Chapter 34 She was starting to wonder at Leander's plan. They were getting close to the border forests. Her arms were bound in tightly knotted rope behind her back. Sitting on either side of her on the shared bench were members of his king's guard. The carriage had one window, and as she looked outside, her worries multiplied. Dawn had started to streak through the trees. Leander had no magic in the daylight hours, though the king supposedly did. Along with a hundred armed fay or so. She breathed through her nose. They'd been trying to get a message out to the humans about the looming threat of war with the fay ever since the full moon. Now that they were crossing the border into the human lands, it had to have been an integral part of their plan now. However, a dark suspicion had started to nag at her. There was no higher plan. Leander truly believed that she'd intended to kill him. She remembered his words after they'd found his mother's dress shredded to bits. You could never do something like this, and why not? His eyes were like dark pits. You hate us. You hate me. It's clear in the way you speak and act. Her heart felt like it was being squeezed. The fay next to her stared. She didn't care. Does he still believe that? They'd stopped. Before the carriage door opened, one of the fay guards kicked her to the floor. With her hands tight behind her, she rolled. When she glared up at them, she bared her teeth like an animal. Want to try that when one of us isn't tied up? But without a word, they pulled her upright again. The carriage door had opened, and on the other side of it stood Leander. He was silent as they forced her out, their blades at her back. She tried to catch his stare, but it was as if he were ignoring her. Her chest tightened and her hands formed useless fists behind her back. Leander, she hissed, but one of the guards whacked the back of her legs with the blunt part of his weapon. What hurt worse than the hit was the fact that he didn't even flinch when she stumbled to the ground beside him. It's an act. It's just an act so the king doesn't suspect anything. The high king walked over to them within a ring of his fey guards. Even though the canopy of leaves above them was thick enough to cast a permanent shadow while they walked inside the border forests, columns of light from the new day stretched across the area with greedy fingers. The forests were perhaps more illuminated than they would have been during high noon. The result was unnerving. These thoughts passed from her as she walked forward through the semi-gloom. She didn't dare look at Leander anymore. At least for the moment, she was on her own. It was then that the humans appeared from among the trees. When she saw her, Anova's stomach dropped. Along with several human constables, she emerged among them with her sparkling, fey made cloak. Braun and Strago were on her either side much more intimidating than the law could ever be. Anova stopped hearing the conversation around her then. A dull ringing began in her ears. The humans and High King were talking about her. She couldn't move. Madame Hinterfell addressed her directly. Maybe it had become obvious that she wasn't listening. When she turned to Anova, her eyes were pure malice. It's been too long, Anova. I see you've been hiding from me here. She couldn't speak. They couldn't take her. She would die before Hinterfell took her, and although the constables were here, Anova knew who was pulling the strings on the side of the humans. The constables brought to the High King heavy bags that she was sure were laden with coin. As one of his attendants accepted them, the High King turned to Leander. When I sent word that I had a human prisoner to trade to them, I discovered a bit of a bounty on your pet's head, Wolfsbane. Who would have foretold such a thing? Her stomach soured. None of this was a coincidence. Madame Hinterfell stepped forward. And she owes me a significant debt as well, your highness. We are thankful you caught her when you did. It was worse than Anova's worst nightmares. Something sharp prodded her forward some steps. The shove came when her knees locked up. No, no, no. 
Her chest was too tight to breathe. She felt like she was watching someone else surrender her freedom, not her. When Bronn touched her to haul her forward, she couldn't keep it inside her any longer. She rolled to the ground, ducking out of his wide reach. Before the Fey guards got her, before she made it to the trees, a pain split through her head. Strago had grabbed a fistful of her hair to pull her up. His knee slammed into her stomach, but she fought to keep what remained of her last meal inside of her. Pain blurred her perception. In that moment, she didn't care about her pathetic plan to tell the humans about the invasion they knew nothing about. She didn't care that this was supposed to all be an act, or even if it wasn't. She didn't care that he hated her now. No, no! The word was torn from her mouth. It was an ugly screech that echoed in the dark forest. She felt tears streak across her face. Anova looked at Leander. She should care that he would walk free, at least. That someone else would carry out this gruesome task they'd started and, in the process, save the human lands from these monsters. But she couldn't care about that now. Leander! Her voice broke on the word. He didn't look at her. Leander! She clawed at the earth as they dragged her past the boundary. She felt it in the air and in her very bones, the loss of magic. It was an odd feeling that made her want to sob. Madame Hinterfell motioned for them to stop dragging Anova for a moment. A constable held a club at her back to keep her on the ground. She crouched to Anova's level and whispered in her ear so quietly that no one else was sure to hear. The constables will take you for now, but you'll be mine soon. Before they dragged her out of sight of the Fae, she saw his face one last time. Chapter 35 When she slept, she dreamed she was in that place again. When her teeth pulverized the pieces of moldy bread they gave her, they were fluffy eggs, roasted quail, and glazed apples. But even in her dreams, she couldn't think of him. Anova woke up to the sound of banging on her cell door. Her tongue moved inside her dry mouth, and she tried not to think when the last time she'd had water was. And she tried not to think how much time she'd wasted in here. How many days. It would bring with it too many other thoughts. You'd better be turned around when I open this, her prison guard said. Anova's lips curled back in the darkness in a silent snarl, but she did as he'd ordered by the time her door banged open. Cold bit into her skin from the metal shackles that he fixed around her wrists. She sniffed. They were thoroughly rusted. Walk, he said, though it was not a necessary command as he shoved her out of her cell. The small space had smelled of human waste even before she'd entered it. Out of her cell, the guard led her through the halls of the dark and damp jail. Her legs were stiff, and her head swam with either hunger or thirst. She wasn't sure which it was. She tried to control her breathing, but by the time she'd gotten to the end of the hall, she was sucking in more breath than she would have needed if she were running through the entire jail. It wasn't that the air here was tastier or better smelling. On the contrary, the deeper they went, the more she smelled unwashed bodies and rats and waste. But she couldn't stop. Hey, her guard snarled, his mustache twitching and rolling as he talked. It reminded her of a caterpillar. Dizziness assaulted her, but she needed more air. Get up. When she didn't respond or move to her feet, the strike to her cheek came fast and without warning. The guard jerked her back on her feet, and the metal chains of her shackles clattered against themselves too loudly. He pulled her close, and the smell of fish on his breath burned her nostrils. Everyone in Urbess smelled of fish. If you don't want to walk, you'll go back in that cell, he said in her face. I can promise you that you won't leave it until you're sentenced like the street scum you are. Her cheek ached from his slap, but Anova forced herself to walk and breathe as well as she could. These were things she needed to master if she were going to survive this. A faint whisper started in the back of her head. Survive this? Survive this for what? There's no way out of any of this. 
but she couldn't think on that any more than she could produce water from the air. They stopped before a door deep within the jail. She wasn't surprised to see who was inside of it, but her heart thrashed against her ribs all the same. The guard closed the door on the three of them, leaving them alone together. Madame Hinterfell clasped her hands on a small table as she leaned forward. Braun stood behind her as her oversized shadow. Has she already gotten Juris? Is he here too? Which is worse? Anova smothered the panic that rose inside her at seeing the woman. Here, it would do her no good. Anova, dear, Hinterfell said. She shook her head at her like she was Anova's mother. She despised it. What a shame. If only you had agreed to work for me from the start, we could have avoided all this. Anova glared at her from across the table. Because there was no guard present, she briefly entertained thoughts of throttling the woman with her bare hands. I was going to pay you back, you know, Anova said as she narrowed her eyes on her. I have been the whole time. Or have you forgotten that? What was I supposed to think when you left? Hinterfell asked. And to find you hiding in Fay. She shook her head again. Anova didn't correct her. Hiding in Fay was a much better assumption than hired as an assassin in Fay. She continued when Anova didn't respond. I brought you here to inform you that the Rosebud bought you. The judge and I came to an agreement regarding the matter. Madame Hinterfell brushed non-existent dust from her shawl. It shouldn't come as a surprise. It's clearly the only way you'll repay me. And I dare say that it's fairer to most everyone involved, including you. Anova felt unable to move or speak. This was it. She'd lost. She'd known this was coming, so why did she feel this way? As she sat there, silent and barely breathing, she thought she knew the answer. It was because she knew with a certainty now. Leander wasn't going to save her. And why would he? She was just the disposable human street rat that he'd hired for a dirty job. The tool to carry out his revenge. And when tools stopped working as they should, they got thrown away. She bit into her tongue, hard enough to taste blood. She couldn't show this monster of a woman a shrivel of her despondency or terror. Hinterfell might have bought her like a second-hand tool, but tools were frequently more dangerous when broken. Her heart hardened into something like the layer of ice on a lake in winter. Anova smiled. She couldn't help it. Is that going to be before or after they invade this city? She asked. Madame Hinterfell's self-satisfied expression froze into unnatural stillness on her face. Her upper lip curled back as she said, You're lying. Anova remained silent and stared back at her. The madam snapped her fingers. Braun moved, and the dim light flashed off the surface of his knife. He wrenched a fistful of her hair back to expose her throat and held his knife there before she could squirm out of the way. Admit it, you've always been a little liar, Madame Hinterfell said. Always sneaking around your mother's skirts. A rat. Anova's pulse picked up at the mention of her mother, but she didn't let it affect her voice. Anova laughed even as the knife pushed harder for it. You should hope their kind craves the pleasures of human flesh rather than just the taste of it. Hinterfell's lips were tight. They don't eat flesh, girl. Anova stopped laughing abruptly and stared back at her. She didn't say more. Madame Hinterfell looked at her, and Anova didn't like the way she seemed to evaluate her. You'll be cured of that smart mouth in due time. Give it a month working for me. The men who like that sort of thing. Well, you should take my advice and fix that soon. Anova's stomach curled into itself. She wished she could make herself sick all over this woman. But she held herself in a tight vice of control. 
When Anova registered the entirety of what Hinterfell had said, she realized more than one thing. She still doesn't believe me. But there was something more, something bigger, something she should have seen from the start. Anova thought back to the hefty sum her people had given to the Fae as her bounty. She thought back to the last few weeks she'd lived in Urbess before Leander had appeared that night. She thought back to the Fae she'd seen on the docks. They're not going to stop at Urbess. Anova leaned forward despite the knife at her throat. Ask yourself. You've seen them with your own eyes now. You've seen their carriages, their armor and clothes, and the luxuries at their fingertips. None of their kind has ever starved. She locked eyes with her enemy. So, why have they increased taxes on us beyond any precedent? Braun, Madame Hinterfell snapped. It was all the command he needed to try to yank her head further back, but she strained against the brute force exerted on her. Ask yourself, Anova said, forcing the last of the words out of her mouth. Are they taxing us for their profit or for our weaknesses? Madame Hinterfell rose so fast that she knocked her chair back. She was before her in an instant, her nostrils flared. But her words were tight and controlled, too quiet to carry outside the room. Before we take you out of this building, we're going to make use of their tools. If I claim it's to find your accomplice, they'll do it for us. Either way, girl, you'll learn meekness. We'll be back for you. It was the last of what she said to her before they shoved her outside to her guard again. When her guard threw her back in her cell, she felt the last pieces of who she'd been break from her. A broken tool is more dangerous than one not. And maybe there was more use for this broken tool yet. Chapter 36 Anova didn't want to sleep anymore. She was envious of those hours now. She'd traded too much of her time for temporary relief. The guard delivered her more water, and with sated thirst came clearer thinking. I need to check, even if the answers aren't easy. Moonlight fell into her cell from a narrow grate in the wall along the ceiling. Anova stood up. It was only wide enough for her to see a sliver of the night sky. She'd been putting it off, but it was time she acknowledged just how long she'd been in here. They haven't invaded yet. It's not too late. Anova pulled herself up along the wall, her fingers digging into the dank stone of the wall as she stretched. Her muscles strained, and she saw into the dark night sky of Urbes. She'd missed the utter darkness of the human lands. Even so, it was too dark for her comfort. After craning her neck, Anova spotted the moon hanging high in the sky, and she exhaled in relief. The High King will invade on the night of the new moon. There's still time. But it was too thin of a crescent to give her any real comfort, and likely too soon for her to get out before it happened. Anova's heart thudded. She'd come all this way, only to be met with failure the size of an unscalable wall. What was there to do now? She hated the question, but she hated the possible answer even more. She tensed, preparing to slam against the hard floor of her cell for when she released the edge of the wall that she clung to. But before she did, a flickering movement caught Anova's attention from the other side of the metal grate. The longer Anova looked, the more she realized a pattern to the shadow obscuring the moon. It moved in the air in its own circle, as if in an endless circuit. The light hit the strange object, and she realized what it was. Or rather, who. Anova's voice was rough from disuse, but it carried in the quiet night. Viridia. The butterfly stopped her circuit and fluttered towards the earth. She landed on the metal grate above Anova's face, slowly flapping her wings in greeting. Anova's heart soared, and her eyes watered. She didn't care if she was just a bug to others. She was her friend. Viridia, she breathed. You followed me. You came after me. 
As she watched, the insect fitted herself between the cracks in the metal, folding her wings as she slipped inside. Anova gasped to see her. She was as beautiful as ever, with her iridescent blue-green wings and her sleek black body. She flew around Anova's head playfully, and Anova slid to the ground where her small friend followed. She couldn't help but grin and laugh when Viridia landed on her forehead. Anova relaxed as well as she could against one of her cell's walls. Gesturing to the space around her, she said, This is where I sleep now. Pretty pathetic, I know. Viridia wiggled her legs as if in sympathy. How long will I be here? But speculations such as these did her no good. Viridia climbed from her forehead down the length of her nose where she rested. Anova closed her eyes and enjoyed the familiar, if silent, company. For the first time since what had happened, she allowed herself to think about him. Did he truly think I'd betrayed him? Or was it all an act to spare my life? Anova stared up at the column of dull moonlight streaming into her cell. It was hard to interpret his actions as if they were on her behalf when he hadn't even looked at her when his king had sold her off to her people. She'd never told him that she'd rather die than be Madame Hinterfell's newest possession. She'd never told him why it was so important that she get her money for the job, or who her mother had been. Anova pulled her knees close to her without disturbing Viridia. She wouldn't cry over him. She couldn't think that he would ever cry over her. Besides, she needed to conserve every drop of water that she had. Or perhaps what happened is that he simply decided to cut his losses. He'd paid for her services. When circumstances proved she couldn't carry out the service she'd promised, he'd reneged on their bargain. It was business. Anova sighed. I shouldn't think on him. As her eyes focused on Viridia's wings slowly unfurling and furling themselves together again, she considered that she might have still had one other friend in the world besides her. Did Juris get caught? The thought had been in the back of her mind for longer than the nights she'd spent in her cell so far. But she'd heard nothing about him, even from Hinterfell. It was a good sign. She remembered her parting words. Before we take you out of this building, we're going to make use of their tools. If I claim it's to find your accomplice, they'll do it for us. Her fingernails dug into her palm hard enough to cause pain, but she ignored the threat for the nugget of information that Hinterfell had let slip. My accomplice. Anova shuddered with relief at the realization. She doesn't have juris. Not yet. But that didn't mean he hadn't starved to death on the streets. Hard as it was to believe, there were dangers out there other than the Madam of the Rosebud. When she'd gone to Fay, she'd taken the key to their livelihood with her. Anova sat with the knowledge. Anova watched Viridia happily bathe in the slim beam of moonlight that was cast across her face. She decided to speak it into existence. Juris is alive and well. He's going to escape this. He'll be fine. Despite her vow to herself that she wouldn't cry more, a tear formed along the corner of one of her eyelids. He would make it out of the city. No matter what was about to happen to her, she had to believe that. She had to believe someone was getting out of this, even if that person wasn't going to be her. Anova pressed a palm to her mouth to keep the sounds inside her that wanted to come out. War was never kind to anyone. It was merciless to those most defenseless. And she was now a prisoner even among her own people. Even outside of these walls, she would be someone else's. Would her throat be slit by the invading Fay before or after the first man paid for an hour with her? How many more men would there be until he rode into the city with the rest of them? Or would he be their king by then with the crown of blood atop his head? Anova held herself tighter as silent tears fell down her face. She couldn't fight to get herself out of this situation. She couldn't bargain her way out either. When she spoke, her voice was hoarse, and it cracked on the words like rocks breaking from a cliff. 
Juris is alive and well. He's... he's going to escape this. She swallowed. He'll be fine. He'll be fine, she repeated, but she realized she wasn't talking about him anymore. She bit down on her hand to stifle the noises that wanted to come out. It was a lie that she needed to tell herself, but she couldn't force the words. Just as she was about to speak them, Viridia unfurled her wings one more time and took to the air above her. Anova watched as she left her cell. Goodbye, my friend, she whispered. The green butterfly took to the free night air outside. Before long, she was out of Anova's sight. Chapter 37 Anova's eyes opened. She hadn't realized that she'd dozed after Viridia had left her, but a small shaft of sun filtered through the grate and told her it was well into the next day. Get up! Her guard's voice came from the other side of her locked cell door. Without prompting this time, Anova turned, her hands behind her back. The manacles slipped over her hands, and she felt the rust flake on her skin. Her pulse thundered through her. It was time. She fought to control her breathing, but it started early this time. She barely heard the guard order her to turn around and leave her cell. Anova fought to keep her gaze straight ahead of her. It had helped last time to keep her focused on moving her feet, but her breathing became too ragged, and despite her best efforts, she sank to the floor again. She braced herself for the impact she knew was coming. Anova? Are you okay? It was whispered into her ear even as the guard jerked her by her upper arm to her feet again. Her eyes swung around to her guard's face for a closer inspection when she stumbled forward. She couldn't believe it. It was Juris. He'd shaven his head, and he was wearing a guard's uniform which she had more than a few questions about how he'd procured. A club swung at his waist. She barely recognized him, though she supposed that was a good thing. As she followed him, her mind raced with questions but she knew there was little use asking any and blowing their cover. Anova kept her eyes straight ahead, acutely aware of each pair of eyes that glanced them over. She resisted looking back at them, guards and prisoners alike. Play the part. They didn't stop until they reached the room in which she'd been processed. Juris swung the door open and grunted at her. Come on, I haven't all day. For good measure, he clenched the club at his waist. Anova suppressed the laugh that wanted to come out of her that was equal parts incredulity at her new situation and unrepressed cheerfulness. Juris loved acting. She stumbled inside, cupping the bruise on her cheek like he'd been the one to give her that and not her true cell guard. The guard inside the processing room jerked his head up from where he'd been hunched over a stack of papers on his desk. The guard's eyes were sharp as his gaze shot to them. His hand slammed down the pen he'd been holding. What are you doing? She's not been approved for release yet. Juris shrugged. Madam Hinterfell's orders, unless you wish to call her here in the middle of her workday to verify? The guard glanced from Anova to Juris, his gaze narrowing the longer he looked. I think I do, actually. He rose from his chair and Anova didn't miss that he moved in the direction of the wall which held several sets of shackles on nails. He knows. And he was going to arrest Juris, too. Without having to say anything, without even having to look at each other, they knew the plan. Since Juris wasn't likely expecting it there, Anova's kick landed squarely in the side. The force threw Juris's head back, though he recovered quickly enough. He freed his club from his waist and swung it for a brutal blow to her head. She ducked with time to spare, aiming a kick to his shins. Restrain her, growled the guard as he took a club from his belt. Anova could feel his approach, but she kept up the onslaught on Juris, allowing more of her attacks to miss. Before the guard's strike hit, Juris's eyes flickered behind Anova. She swiveled in the blink of an eye. Her kick, intended for Juris, hit the guard in his side. He stumbled from her momentum and Anova took the chance to aim one between his legs. Before it landed, 
The guard's fist clamped around her upper arm, and he dragged her to the ground with her manacled hands. Get the chains for her legs, the guard shouted as his knee dug into her back. Quick as lightning, Juris moved, though not for the chains hanging on the wall. His club hit the back of the guard's head, and Anova heard him crumble to the ground beside her with a thunk. She looked at his face beside her on the ground. His breath tickled her face. He'll wake up sooner or later. We have to move. Juris was already forcing a key through the lock in the bar that held together her wrist manacles. You'll want a disguise, he huffed. The rest of them probably won't buy the story either. Anova rolled and got to her feet as she massaged her wrists. She resisted asking him how he'd known she was back in Urbess or how he'd found her. That could come later. If there is a later. After she'd stripped the guard of his outer clothes and shrugged into them as well as she could, they hid him behind his desk and shackled him to it. She locked gazes with Juris. It was just like their jobs in the taverns before Faye. She just needed to be someone else for a while. Are you ready to do this? He asked, his hand on the knob that led through the rest of the jail towards the surface. More than you know, she said. Through the streets of Urbess, they ran. Fresh air pulverized her lungs, and she sucked in as much of it as she could stand. It wasn't the saccharine sweet air of Fay, but it was home. They didn't look back, and she barely looked around her at the people they were shoving past to get to their alleys. The sun felt uncomfortable on her skin, marking her with its brightness. More than she had when she lived in Urbess, she belonged to the night now. She followed close behind Juris, not daring to ask where their safe house was now, or even if there was a safe house anymore. Thus, it came as a surprise to her when Mara's bakery was suddenly before them. They came to the back, and the rickety metal ladder was still there, leading to the attic room. Anova almost couldn't find the words. It's safe here? It's my second night back, Juris said and his gray eyes seemed to beg for rest rather than answers. Anova bit her tongue. She wanted to ask how and why, but they needed to get inside. And what would come after that, she didn't want to think about. But as they came to the last step in the ladder attached to the back of the building, Anova froze. Perched on the railing was an insect flapping its wings slowly. She held out a finger and allowed her to crawl on her digit. Viridia, she gasped. There could be no question. But how? Juris was staring. Do you know this bug? She's a friend, Anova said defensively, aware of how unhinged she was surely sounding. His eyebrows raised at the butterfly. It doesn't surprise me. I do too. He glanced to the city behind them, likely now swarming with constables hunting for them. Let's get inside. There are some things I'd like to know. It was as she'd remembered it. Juris hadn't even put up her blanket. Aside from their beds on the floor, all that remained inside the loft was their clothes and the trunk of the rest of their possessions. Anova sat on the floor on her blanket, running her hands over the rough wool. Now that she was back where she used to live, none of it seemed real. She looked at the boy across from her that she'd considered a brother for most of her life. He'd shaved his brown curls, likely to keep the law off his trail. Anova frowned. He was thin. This is probably what Leander saw when we first met. She pushed the thought away. She was home. How? Her voice cracked on the word. When he looked at her, she saw how it must have been. His gray eyes were hard. She'd managed to get not a word back to him once she'd stepped on the other side of the boundary. I didn't think I'd see you alive again, Anova, he managed. Anova darted forward and Juris returned the hug. Juris, I'm sorry. I'm so damned sorry. Her words were barely audible, but she knew he'd heard her. For several days, she'd been back in the city she'd been born in but the first time she felt like she could breathe here again was at that moment. Chapter 38 It was a dream. Juris shook his head. A vision. 
he corrected himself, unprompted by her. Anova's breath caught. It sounded like fey magic. You had a vision about breaking me out of jail? Not quite, Juris frowned. I just saw that you were there. It seemed too real, however. I woke up with that butterfly on my face. He narrowed his eyes at her. I closed the doors and windows, so I'm not sure how it got in. Anova was silent as she watched Viridia flutter through the air above their heads. She's a special one. She's been touched by magic. As she spoke, she realized more. She must have planted the idea in your head after she visited me. She couldn't believe it. Viridia had helped save her. She let the insect land on her nose as she rested her wings. Juris watched, appearing to digest what she was saying. Apparently so. Juris shook his head like the idea was having trouble settling inside his brain. When I woke up, I did some spying. There seemed to be an excessive number of guards visiting the rosebud, so I took the gamble and figured that they really had you. Her eyebrows met. And the guard uniform? Juris cracked a smile. I acquired the uniform through a means. Anova rolled her eyes, although she was impressed. She'd always figured a guard would be a tough one. Where is he? She asked with a straight face. Probably still locked in the room I rented out in the last chance, he said with a devilish smirk. She could only guess how he'd gotten a guard to come to his room. Mikhail's been allowing me to stay there when he has vacancies. His smile straightened to a thin line. Anova, what in the fey happened to you? What's going on? Anova dragged a deep breath out of her. There was no pretending that things were fine. She needed to explain a few things. Her heart raced as if it were eager to get to its own destruction, to the end of her tale. Once she'd told him who she'd been hired to kill, that they'd planned to assassinate the High King, Juris had been silent. He watched her now, his face a mask as she spoke. It was either give up our cover or give up me, she shrugged. Her voice was hollow. So the Fey King traded with Hinterfell and the constables for my bounty. He sold you out? Juris's gray eyes were sharp. Leander made the only decision there was. Our partnership is over, she said. It was difficult saying the words, even if they were true. She swallowed. Somehow she hadn't even gotten to the worst of it yet. She had to get it out. She leaned forward, and her voice was a hoarse whisper. That's not all. They're coming, Juris. Soon. His jaw moved mechanically as he spoke in a strained voice. What are you talking about? They're going to invade Urbess on the new moon. I told Hinterfell, though I don't know if she believed me. None of the rest of Urbess knows. Juris stared forward into nothingness. She continued speaking. From what I could tell, it's only a few days from now. His gaze snapped up to hers. We have to sneak aboard one of their ships. It's the only way out now. Suddenly, he was on his feet. We'll do it tonight. He started pacing, looking out their dormer window. We'll have to take extreme caution with them crawling the city for us. We'll take routes we haven't taken in years. It goes without saying that we'll have to ditch these uniforms as well. Juris. Juris stopped his pacing at the tone of her voice and looked back at her. I have to go back. He was beside her in a moment. Anova, you know this city won't stand against an attack by them. We leave or we die here. You're going to leave. You have to go. Without me. Anova grabbed him by his arms. A storm gathered in Juris's gray eyes. He hardly got like this, but when he did, it was worse than when Anova did. Do you hear yourself? He said. She bit into her cheek. She had to convince him to go without her, which was beginning to seem impossible. Even now, returned to his side, she felt well again, whole. He was her family. But she had to push him away. Please, Juris, 
she said, not realizing when she'd started begging. You have to get as far away from this place as possible. But I have to go back to Faye. I... I have to be the one that does it. She breathed out a shaky exhale. I have to stop this war before it starts. I have to end the line of Fey royalty so this never happens again. Returning to Urbess had reminded her of memories she would have rather forgotten. Five years ago, one of their kind murdered a woman in cold blood. All because he had the power over her to do so. How many others had they killed? Abused? Taken? It was time to take some of that power from them and ensure none of their kind hurt humans ever again. It was time to destroy the blood crown. And she'd realized something else in the days that she'd slept away, rotting in her cell. No matter the meaning of Leander's actions, no matter if he believed she'd betrayed him or if he believed he was saving her life by allowing his king to trade her to her people, she'd been the one who hadn't trusted him. And yet, he'd given over that part of him that he'd held private for so many years. Cadmus. She'd never told him who she really was, where she came from, what she feared. And she'd nearly lived out her nightmares because of it. Juris's expression changed. His eyes searched hers in silence. He took a step back, his gaze unwavering. If this is what you want... I'll help you get out of the city and back to their lands. Just, his lips pressed tight together. Just promise me that you'll come back from this. I don't care how or when, just come back. There was no looking away from his gaze. If she did, she wouldn't be able to convince him. Even though she was a born liar, she hated to lie to Juris but she didn't need him doing something as stupid as she was doing. She needed him to live. The lie came out smoother than it should have. I promise I'll come back. She had no idea if she would. They were out of the city by sunset, dressed for the shadows. The deeper they went in the border forests, the harder Anova's heart raged. Viridia followed them overhead. This night was darker than the night she'd been here with Leander. Her pulse throbbed in her veins. She needed to talk to Juris before she crossed over. A Nova swallowed as they passed under two hazel trees intertwined by their upper branches. It was a sign they were getting close. I'm sorry that I left like that. I meant to come back sooner than this. Juris turned to her, his eyebrows low on his face. About that. I was under the impression we were getting riches, that you'd rob him blind and get out. Anova frowned. She didn't relish where this was going. Something's changed, she said. Juris was silent for a few paces through the gloom before saying, You care for him. Or did, perhaps. Anova walked into a low, bare branch and it smacked her in response. She cursed, picking twigs out of her hair. How could Juris say such a thing? Because it's true, her miserable thief heart said. You care for him, and he traded you for a sack of coins. Anova stomped harder on the fallen leaves and soft earth below. Things such as words tangled inside the middle of her throat. She needed to talk about something else. Anything else. You're going to the docks after this, right? She hadn't thought it would be a difficult question, but when he didn't respond, she spun on him. You can't. Juris. Juris smiled at her. You're using our names again. It's good to hear it. Her teeth came together with a snap. You're not staying. The whole city is a trap. Juris's smile faded, though the expression that was left on his face wasn't a harsh one. There are others who need to get out, too. Our mother's friends at the Rosebud? Mikhail? Mara? Anova stopped in her path and sighed as she looked back at her old friend. When did we get this soft? But she knew he had to do it, just as she had to go back to Faye. She frowned. 
And what if I don't do it in time? All of you can't smuggle yourselves on boats. You'll just need to not fail, Juris said simply. Before she could respond to that, Anova noticed something. Really, she'd noticed it before that moment, but she hadn't known until then. What is it? Juris said. Anova's voice was tight. We've gone in a circle. Juris spun and saw what she'd seen, the downed tree that they'd passed twenty minutes ago. It was covered in a blanket of moss, but only on the side where the moonlight slipped through the branches overhead. It was split into two on one end. There could be no mistake. They had gone in a circle. Before Anova could do anything about it, a noise like feet crunching leaves sounded ahead of them. Without another word, they shoved themselves behind the fallen tree. She didn't quite taste magic in the air yet, but she felt that the moon was stronger here, even waning as it was. They were close to the threshold between their lands, or so she thought. Maybe Faye is playing tricks on us. It sounded like the weight of a great beast moving around ahead of them. Anova pressed herself tighter against the rotted log. The crunching of leaves echoed against the trunks of the trees. Are we too late? Have they started the invasion already? Anova was sure her heartbeat was loud enough to be heard. Juris was beside her, his eyes straight ahead. Neither of them moved. They spent several minutes like that, and Anova lost track of time. She wasn't sure when the silence had started to invade the area again, but she startled as if coming out of a trance. I think it's gone, she mouthed to Juris. I'm going to look. Juris stared at her, the meaning behind his expression clear. Are you sane? She wasn't sure, but she knew the longer they spent in these woods, the less time they had to stop the Fey King. Anova held her breath and twisted herself around to look on the other side of their cover. The boundary forests were still once more. Gloom and darkness pervaded every surface. Even where the sky was visible and the moon unnaturally bright, only a sliver of light reached the ground. Except for one thing. As she looked towards it, Anova couldn't even swallow. Some distance away from where they hid was a bright spot of amber light. It shifted and moved, morphing between long stretches of shadow and the single star of light. Anova realized that wherever the light was coming from, it was passing between the trunks of the trees. The light fell on surfaces that Anova felt shouldn't have been illuminated. Sticks in the ground became what they were. Dead trees. The light didn't hold back. It made her skin crawl. And it was drawing closer. Anova sucked in a silent breath and ducked down to Juris's level. What did you find? Her lips were tight. What could she tell him? When she didn't answer, Juris gave her shoulders a shake. Stay with me. What's out there? Do we need to go? Anova stared straight ahead. She was beginning to understand, but it would be difficult to explain in whispers. It could be their salvation or their utter destruction. Juris twisted himself to look at it. He was above the log for several seconds before he shoved himself back into cover. His gray eyes were wide. She knew what he was thinking. That it was the first of their army. Or perhaps even worse, this was some fey beast that attracted wayward humans to it like moths to a light. But it reminded Anova of something else entirely. Every night thereafter, the fey princess led her human lover to her by the light of her lantern, and they met under the darkness of the forests. Her heart throbbed inside its cage of bones. Could it be him? But the other part of the fable came to her then. The fey king took his daughter's lantern as the vesper star streaked across the sky, leading it from the castle through the great forests around it. In the darkness of the night, the human boy followed the light of the fey king. The king stood on the other side of a great chasm. Trusting his fey lover, the human boy fell to his death. Which one was it? The trick or the truth? 
It hadn't been in the direction they were heading, but then again, they were lost. Could she trust the Fae? Could she trust him? After all that had happened to her, was it better to be hard and distrustful or gullible and cheated? What if she wasn't either? Sweat poured down her back. She'd survived this long, trusting only in herself and her small family. But maybe she could do more than survive. Anova got up and jumped over the log. She heard Juris call for her behind her, but she didn't stop. Breath puffed in front of her in clouds as she ran through the dim forest and towards the light. It may have been the stupidest thing she'd done lately, and she'd done a few of those sort of things. But she had to see if it was him, if he was waiting for her. Her training had paid off. Juris couldn't hope to keep up. It's best this way in case it's a trap. Cold air scorched her lungs as she sprinted the distance. The dark forest blurred past her, twigs and branches scraping at her clothes. The amber light grew brighter. Anova had to squint against it to see anything at all. She swallowed down her fears and the voices inside her head begging her to turn around, go back to her attic space above the bakery and lock herself inside it for a week. She couldn't go back. Her footsteps slowed as her eyes adjusted to the lantern the Fae held aloft. They were in the thick of the dark boundary forests. Just like the dawn she'd been sold to the humans by the King of Fae, the light illuminated things that lived in the ever-present gloom. She could hear Juris behind her. He'd nearly gained on her. The Fae before her wasn't Leander. Chapter 39 Miriam brought the flickering lantern to his waist. Anova's eyes went to something else that rested there. He was wearing a weapon, openly. What was more, it wasn't one of their short blades like he and Leander possessed. It was a sword staff, exactly like the ones the High King's guard carried. The shaft poked into the air like a declaration of war. The air was thick here, and heat spread up her throat as she tried to calm herself. Did Nerium still owe his allegiance to House Wolfsbane? If that was the case, where was Leander? She looked back into his eyes, but before she could speak, Juris had caught up. He froze when he saw Nerium. Juris's eyes didn't leave the phase as he pulled a knife out of his pocket and held it low. Who are you? A nova shifted in front of him. A fight wasn't what they needed, not when they were already on the eve of war with their kind. It's okay, she said to Juris. Nerium, this is Juris. Juris, he's not one of his soldiers then. Fine with me. Juris pocketed the knife before she could finish. Anova's mouth was dry. She wasn't so sure of that anymore. She couldn't speak. Nerium had watched the interaction silently, one of his eyebrows raised. He moved forward then, but only by one step. To her surprise, he looked to Juris. Unless you wish to remain in Fay indefinitely, I wouldn't take another step. His gaze went to Anova's face, and there was something in his eyes that she couldn't quite interpret. The High King has spelled the boundary line. Anyone and anything may pass through to this side, but nothing is allowed out. She swallowed. She could almost see where the boundary was, and she'd nearly passed it in her sprint to get to the lantern. Why? She searched his face. There were many questions she needed answers to, but this was the first she could manage. How could that benefit him? Miriam's eyes were flat. Your smiths have been forging him new weapons. He has conscripted most of Fay. Anova felt like her heart had dropped somewhere into her stomach. It made her sick to consider humans were making the weapons of their own destruction but she could guess why the smiths had done it. There had either been promises of tickets out of her best for them and their families, or they'd had no choice to begin with. The question she needed to ask was as tangible in the air like fey magic. Anova took one more step forward. Where is Leander? The emotion that had been in Nerium's eyes spread to the rest of his expression at the mention of his fey master. Anova couldn't breathe. 
Her voice rose several pitches. Miriam, where is he? Juris's hand found her shoulder. She hadn't noticed that she'd taken another step towards the boundary line. You followed the lantern. I have to admit, I was depending on your return. But I knew you'd remember the fable. I had to try. Miriam's eyes flicked to the side before he looked back at them. I've been killing his boundary guards in this area. They would have been here by now otherwise. The cold pricked at her skin, but she couldn't move to warm herself. Why was Miriam this desperate to get her back to Faye? But she thought she knew why already. She nodded at what he'd said. You knew I'd come back too. I guessed you would, Miriam said with what was the phantom of a smile. It dissolved a second later. Even with what happened here. Juris glanced at Anova beside him. He whispered to her without taking his eyes off the fae. What's going on, Anova? Something horrible. It was stewing in the air. Leander was in grave danger. Her only consolation was that if he were dead already, Miriam wouldn't have bothered trying to get her to cross the boundary into Fay. Her voice was quiet, though she knew it would carry across the boundary. He's got Leander, hasn't he? Miriam's mouth barely moved, but his eyes were haunted by some thought as he spoke. Yes. Anova, don't. Juris's hand squeezed her shoulder lightly as he spoke in a whisper that she knew the Fae would hear anyway. He's not telling you everything. She broke her stare with Miriam to turn to her friend. I know. She held his gaze, willing him to understand. But I still have to go. Juris was quiet for a handful of seconds before he stepped forward, his arms around her in an embrace. Be safe, he said in her ear. She nodded against him. She would try. Anova breathed through her nose to try to calm herself, though it did nothing for the thoughts swimming around in her head. Her hands formed fists. It had to be her. It had always needed to be her, she realized. Anova took a step and then another, and a strange feeling washed over her skin like warm water. She was in Fay. Above her head, Viridia fluttered and danced in the moonlight. It was already brighter, and the air was heavy with the sweet smell of flowers. She turned to watch Juris leave. Tears stung her eyes, but she refused to shed them. They had Fay to kill. Miriam held his empty hand palm out in a shaft of white moonlight, and liquid silver dribbled into it. Viridia landed on the tip of one of his fingers and crawled down it to drink the nectar. As she watched, she said, I won't try to go back. Tell me what's happened to Leander. Miriam's cunning eyes flashed to hers. It was a most fey thing to do, to leave out the most important part of an agreement until it was too late. She had to remind herself who she was dealing with, even if they were on the same side and she still wasn't decided about that either. Miriam's eyes were on the butterfly drinking from his palm. There's something you should know about the blood crown. She blinked. This wasn't where she expected their conversation to go. What is it? She asked. We deciphered its origins from the Book of Fey Tales on the night the High King came, Miriam said. He looked up at her. It was the story that you read. The one where the Fey King killed his daughter's human lover. Her skin crawled. She remembered it well, but there was a problem. I never read the end of it, she admitted. Besides, she considered silently, there hadn't been any blood crowns in it up until that point. Miriam stepped back as Viridia took to the air, drunk on Fey magic. She backed up to give her room and the insect started to transform before their eyes. In the story, Miriam said, the human boy's mother discovered what had happened. She was a witch, known in her human village for healing arts. Miriam glanced over at her in the darkness. This was when your kind had magic. 
She shook her head. Her kind had never had any magic. It made as much sense as the rest of the fey tale, but she gestured for him to continue. She couldn't bring her son back to life, so she wanted the fey king to experience the pain he'd inflicted on her. Anova ran her hand over Viridia's back as her pit-black eyes watched her. She killed the fey princess, she guessed. No, actually. Miriam's eyebrows twitched perhaps an amusement of her apparent gory imagination. After preparing her spell, the witch went to bed with thoughts of what the Fey King had done to her son. Shortly after, the Fey Princess woke from the same visions. In her dreams, she'd seen the truth of what her father had done. She rose with the moon and killed her father. As his only heir, she inherited the throne despite her crime of patricide. Anova's hand stilled over Viridia's sleek body. Her tongue moved in her dry mouth. The pieces of the larger picture moved into place. The blood crown, she whispered. It's a curse placed on fey kind by humans, Miriam said. Namely, one human, the witch. Anova sipped a breath of perfumed air. It did nothing to steady her head. The deadliest of fey artifacts had come from a human witch and her magic. She wished she could sit down. She couldn't believe it. This is good, isn't it? Despite her attempts to swallow it down, her voice was fragile with hope. The crown can be destroyed. Curses can be broken. Miriam's face was grave, and she didn't understand why, at least until he spoke. The spell exacted a high price of the human witch. She did not wake. Miriam paused before adding, For any human that tries to use it, the blood crown will take their life. After a moment, Anova sank to the cold forest ground. Her chest felt like it was getting tighter by the second. As it turned out, she couldn't do anything at all. Viridia's thin snout found her forehead. Her voice was scratchy when she spoke. She didn't bother to clear it. Why am I here, Niriam? She looked at him. Why were you here, waiting for me for days? He was silent for several more seconds before speaking again. When he spoke, it wasn't to answer her question either. By the time we realized the true meaning of the fable, the High King had arrived, Miriam said. Leander decided, rather than you become tempted to exchange your life to destroy the crown, that he would take the High King's ultimatum and expel you from Fae. Too many thoughts occurred to her at once. One emerged from all the others. He didn't think I'd betrayed him. He was trying to save me. Anova crossed her arms. Leander could have mentioned something about that. She frowned. There'd been so little time to say anything between the three of them, but he could have at least looked at her. She couldn't let herself dwell on that moment if she wanted to be able to stand again. Anova found her voice again and asked, Where is he now? She hadn't missed that he'd, yet again, dodged her question. At the Wolfsbane estate, along with the rest of his army. After banishing you to the human lands, he pledged himself to the High King and forbade me from returning to him. He's going to do it himself, Anova said as she realized it. He's going to kill the High King and take the blood crown himself. He was vehemently opposed to becoming the High King before, but now that it's the only real option. You misunderstand, he said. Something in Miriam's mask slipped again. He held her gaze despite the uncharacteristic wild look creeping into his face. It rose the hairs on the back of her neck. He's going to kill the High King. After that, to destroy the crown and line of succession, he plans to kill himself. Foolishly. Anova had risen to her feet sometime in the last few minutes, but she swayed now, her knees buckling. 
No. No. He can't. We have to go, she blurted. We have to stop him. No matter what the answer to this war was, it wasn't that. She wouldn't let it be. Anova remembered how Leander hadn't been able to meet her gaze when he'd agreed to banish her from Fay. A pit formed in her belly. This had been his plan from the moment he'd learned what would happen if she tried to destroy the blood crown. The tears tried to blur her eyes now, but she wiped them away with the back of her hand. There was no time for wallowing. Turning to him, she asked, How long do we have? Miriam's eyes went to the stars above them. A day from now. She swallowed her panic, too. Anova and Nerium mounted Viridia and took to the skies above the dark boundary forests. As the pale silver of crescent moon shone down on them, she made a silent plea to the fortunes that ruled humans and Fae's lives. Don't let it be too late. Chapter 40 the Wolfsbane estate was already in sight among the rolling hills of the Sorolands. It hadn't been long enough. Anova wasn't ready. She didn't think she ever would be. She broke the silence between them. Do you truly think this will work? But she knew he was aware of what she was really asking. Would this plan destroy the crown while allowing them all to live? If something seemed too good to be true... It probably was, though her nerves tangled up in her chest at the possibility. It's the only plan I can consider, Miriam murmured where he sat behind her. He was right. Despite the risks, they had to try. The gust kicked up from Viridia's wings pummeled her face, but she dared not turn her gaze away from the speck on the landscape where they headed. They would need to dive for the trees soon to avoid being spotted against the sky. Anova went over the plan's details in her head. The only way to potentially keep all three of them alive while also destroying the crown, or at least disrupting the line of succession, would be for multiple fae to deal the fatal blow to the High King as one. Nerium theorized that this would shatter the blood crown, or at least dilute its power into as many pieces if it wasn't broken irreparably. Ideally, the fae who did this would be Nerium and Leander though there is still a chance that our appearance will force Leander's hand. Anova bit at her lip. Which was the more possible option? That they could convince Leander from his brutal path of self-destruction, or that they could initiate a revolution among the Fae most devoted to the High King? Her hands twitched in anticipation. All she needed to do was to get her hands around Leander. She would make him listen to her. Don't let it be too late. She forced breaths in and out of her. She couldn't let the panic overcome her. There was much to do yet. The silence pressed against them once more as solidly as the wall of wind from Viridia's wings. Anova swallowed. She needed to distract herself from the likely grim outcomes that loomed before them, even if for a few more minutes. She squinted at the land below them. You never told me why. Not exactly. You never told me why you were so desperate to find me. If I wasn't to do it myself, why did you come back to find me? Anova resisted the urge to twist herself to see Miriam's face. Instead, she stared down at the horizon before them, wondering how many hours of darkness they had left. He did more than forbade me from setting foot on the estate again. I am no longer in the service of his house. After a moment, Miriam added, Instead, he gifted my services for the remainder of my life to you. Or rather, he said, reconsidering, for the remainder of your lifetime. Anova nearly slipped from Viridia. What? It was the most she could say. Her head spun. What use did she have for a fey manservant? I... Her throat felt clogged. These fey who lived in decadent palaces and who lived forever and who ate glazed duck under the full moon, they were so different from her. He wouldn't understand. But she said it anyway. Miriam, I live in an attic space in Urbes. I have no use for someone like you. You are freed from any duty you feel you owe to me. 
His chuckle stirred up the hairs on the back of her neck. Do you truly think the only service I provided to him was pouring him fey wine? She couldn't help herself. She twisted to look at his face. His eyes were glittering and dark against the night sky, and she was reminded of the fey who had manipulated her, ever so slightly, into crossing the border into fey perhaps an hour ago. For his father, I used to kill other fey. Miriam said in a low voice. For him, I have killed significantly fewer, but protected him against significantly more threats. She shouldn't have been surprised, given his experience with weapons in a land where they were banned, but she was. She nodded and attempted to take this information in stride. She could have use for an armed fey lackey. Anova sensed something else, though. You are still loyal to him she guessed. You've been serving his family for decades. She wondered if it had been longer, but for some reason she didn't wish to find out. My son died long before Cadmus and Leander were born. While they weren't the same as him, they became like my own sons. The knowledge sat heavy inside her. And even after that, he lost one of them. Fay was a brutal place, and she would do best to remember it. Anova hadn't replied to what he'd said, but Nerium continued speaking anyway. His words were quiet, almost silent, as Viridia glided towards a break in the trees. If it comes to it, I will do it myself, Nerium said. Rather than have him destroy his own life for it, I will destroy the crown. The meaning behind his words assaulted her. Anova didn't know what to say. She had no chance to respond as they hit the ground in a loose gallop. Anova held herself against Viridia tighter to stay upright. Her stomach turned from the combination of his words and the rough ride, and her teeth clamped down against each other. She needed to be strong. She needed to convince Leander to work with them. When they dismounted from Viridia, Nerium went to work drawing magic from moonlight filtered from the canopy above. First, he started with his own clothes. Leather hardened until it was the shining black metal armor that his guards wore. He then worked on Anova's clothes, transforming her rough spun dress into the same armor, and then he moved to their weapons. Putting aside the sword staff, he produced four small knives that she didn't recognize. Most of his guards have more than one weapon on them he explained. She nodded as she remembered how he'd killed some of his border guards already. She should have expected that. Nerium picked up a glass vial that he must have set aside when changing his clothes. As the light caught on it, she knew what it was. Poison, she murmured. Ground wolf Spain, to be precise, Nerium said with a firm expression. I've combined it with liquid moonlight to allow it to last longer in the open air. The knife in his hand drank from the poison, and the magic in the mixture bound it to the metal. It looked like little more than polish, and she suppressed a shiver. With such a weapon, killing the Fey King would be easy. The hard part would be getting to him. He repeated the process with the other knives and handed her half. Instantly, she felt better armed with two weapons deadly enough to kill any Fey with ease. Nerium turned to her before they continued through the last of the woods surrounding the Wolfsbane estate. You should keep your ears hidden, he said. With such weak moonlight, I don't think it's wise to try to change them as they are. Anova untied the knot holding her hair close to her head and ran her fingers through it. If it was a choice between this or having Nerium use their temperamental magic on her body, she didn't have to be told twice. Before they continued forward, Nerium gathered a bundle of detritus from the ground that included pine needles, tree branches, pine cones, leaves, and bird feathers. She watched in silence, waiting for the meaning of what he was doing to become clearer to her. He poured the last droplets of fey magic over them. The bundle of decaying matter transformed into two masks that would cover much of the face. The scales of the pine cones had formed a mask of glittering dragon scales. It was breathtaking by itself. Looking at the other, 
she gasped audibly. Twigs were woven into themselves, forming the base of the mask. The magic had sewn bird feathers throughout it, small and delicate but big enough to obscure her face. It was impossible and beautiful. It's all fey illusions, she reminded herself. The masks would become useless come morning. These are the sort of things his soldiers will be wearing, Miriam explained. It will help us blend in. Though she donned her mask with gratitude for the disguise, Anova's stomach soured. The Fey would wear the hides of monsters when they invaded her lands. The outside will finally match the inside. As the trees thinned and they approached the estate, her mouth popped open. She stopped in her tracks. Shh, Miriam whispered. She hadn't been aware that she'd made an audible noise. I thought that was just in my head. At the sight in front of them, Anova clamped her teeth together. Her stomach roiled and fought against her. Mission or not, she was going to be sick. She sank to the ground, pressing her head between her knees. Pikes had been driven into the ground all around the manor. There had been no regard for the sprawling maze of flowers. Many had been ripped up for the tents populating the area. But that wasn't what had made her sick. On the ends of many of the pikes were heads. She dared not look if they were fey or human. She wasn't sure that it mattered anyway. Anova doubled down and ran for the last tree they'd passed, heaving at the ground when she got there. Miriam was behind her at once, silent as the trees around her. He waited patiently for her to finish. Anova wiped her mouth with the back of her hand and stood. I'm fine, she declared to him, but he didn't respond. Perhaps he'd scented the lie. At this hour, perhaps it didn't matter if she was fine anymore. Anova pulled herself up again. They needed to move. Tents clustered together on the lawn of wildflowers, and goblin-like fay ran from them, carrying such things as bracers, food, and sharpened sticks. Other fay were gathered elsewhere, stalking each other with blasts of silver magic or silver blades. Dark eyes followed them, and she prayed they didn't recognize them. The estate was in ruins. The roof of Leander's greenhouse had been partially destroyed. Cracked glass faced the sky like a gaping mouth full of teeth. Windows of the estate had been shattered, and the columns at the front of the manor had been chipped apart with what appeared to have been fey magic. Anova kept her head down for two reasons. First, they were less likely to be noticed if she looked at any of the fey directly. Second, she didn't wish to look upon the heads that were on the pikes all around them, or who they'd belonged to. Leander's sanctuary had been turned into a war camp. As they approached the front, his soldiers stood guard. The closest to Anova, a fay with eyes that looked like a snake's, stared at her. At least he wasn't Iona or another fay that would have recognized her instantly. But it was hard to remind herself of that when he wouldn't look away from her. What do you want? His voice was low and harsh. We have business with the High King, Miriam said, his body half blocking Anova's so the guard would be forced to acknowledge him. It can't wait. The snake eyed Fay laughed in their faces. Everyone here has business with the High King. His laughter stopped too suddenly to be genuine. You can wait with the rest of the war party in your tents. We march for their lands tomorrow. Cut your teeth on some other animal's bones until then. His words made her skin crawl. The Fey King had conscripted every able Fey into fighting her people, but that didn't mean there weren't many who wouldn't relish the idea of killing a few humans. Anova could feel the eyes of the heads on the pikes around them. She could feel the shadows they made against the moonlight. She said, Our scouts have found proof that knowledge of this attack has leaked to the human lands. She crossed her arms as she looked up at the Fey. Unless you think the High King would rather hear this information on the eve of battle tomorrow? The snake eyed Fey's lip curled back in a silent snarl. Very well. He moved to the side to allow them passage through the open doors. 
but don't blame me if you're beheaded like the others. A dark chuckle followed them inside the hall, and the doors closed on them. Chapter 41 When they crossed the threshold into the Wolfsbane Manor, it was almost unrecognizable to her. The portraits were the first of what was missing, aside from one that remained on the far end. It was the one of his father. The canvas had been torn cleanly down the middle as if with a blade. She wondered how it had happened and who had done it, but she didn't allow her gaze to linger there. Fay rushed from room to room, but these weren't the goblin Fay from the war tents. Some were dressed in war regalia, their sword staffs affixed to their backs against polished armor. Others sported animal ears that she wondered if were magicked or real, and teeth that slipped past their lips. Those that hadn't painted their faces around their eyes and mouths had donned masks made of bones and bird feathers, much like their own. Fear rattled inside her chest, but it was too late to acknowledge. This is how they plan to win. This isn't going to be a war. It's a reign of terror. By keeping their heads down, Anova and Nerium blended into the wall of Fay, rushing from one room to the next. But when they entered the dining room, she couldn't stop staring. His court had spread out through the hall. In the center of it, the High King was on his throne, his eyes bored on the supplicant before him. Surrounding him were those most loyal to the crown. His consorts lounged in chairs as opulent as the throne, but instead of war paint and open weapons, they wore veils as black as midnight that were embroidered with silver lace. Their clothes were just as elegant and dark. They reminded Anova too much of death's cavalry. The High King's guards flanked him on all sides. Among them was a fae that she recognized all too well. Helmir was near the High King. Instead of a throne, he was propped on one of Leander's dining chairs. In his palm was an apple too green not to be bitter. His eyes roved across the wide hall filled with fey between bites. When they entered on the far end of the room, his eyes flicked in their direction momentarily. Anova released a breath when she saw his gaze continue across the hall past them. Malor was next to him, his red eyes looking bored for once. At his waist was the curved blade that he'd nearly beheaded her with. It was then that she saw him. Leander stood too close to the High King for her liking. His arms were crossed at his chest, and a dark cloak flowed over his shoulders, though she could plainly see the coat he wore underneath. It was the coat of a war general, trimmed in gold and silver. A black rose was pinned to his chest. It was then that she realized why they all wore black. It was more than stealth. They were making a mockery of her people. It was as if the humans were already dead, and this was their funeral. They would come, armed high on their horses and wearing clothes blacker than the night. They were like death, all of them. Even from this far, she could see his expression. Shadows ringed his eyes, and there was a look to them she didn't favor. He appeared as if he hadn't slept from the time they departed. He looks ill. Her heart slammed into her ribs. There was no question anymore. He was planning to end it all here, with himself. But all this wasn't what stopped her in her tracks. On top of the dining hall's tables were cages of rope and woven wood. Her stomach flopped over and over. Trapped inside the largest were humans. Nerium grabbed her arm, but she couldn't move. Nearest to her, inside the cage, was a girl a few years younger than her. Though she didn't cry, her eyes were wide and unblinking as she watched the nightmare around her. Where had they stolen her from? Had she been in Fay already? And the worst question yet rose up from her stomach like bile. What's going to happen to her here? She felt like she was going to be ill again. Anova let Nerium pull them forward, closer inside the gathered fay. They'd interrupted a gathering, and someone was speaking. 
This will be the last time I allow you the choice. It was the High King's voice. Anova tried to keep her eyes down to prevent other Fae from recognizing her, but she couldn't help but look up at the words. They'd gotten close enough to see her. Iona was on her knees before the Fae King, her hands bound behind her back. I told you, she said as she bared her teeth at him. I won't follow you anymore. Why should I die for you? Why should we kill for you when you're killing your own people? The High King's voice was matter-of-fact, almost light. It chilled her. It seems you will die either way, she-warrior. He motioned to the guards beside her, and they brought the edges of their sword ends to her throat. Will those be your last words? he asked. Iona turned to the fae on the king's right. Leander, you cannot agree with this. Anova's stomach lurched. She and Nerium shared a look. Leander's sleepless gaze moved to the fae on the floor before him. To death, I would serve my lord. Anova couldn't breathe. She didn't miss the double meaning, and she hoped no one else caught it. He was planning to do it soon. Among them all, she felt it. They were out of time. The High King smiled at her sadly and shook his head. See, why couldn't you be more like Wolfsbane? He took a step forward. His retinue of guards angled themselves where he walked. It was like watching plants grow towards the sun. I will never submit to you again, Iona said. Then you must die, he sighed, his mask of joviality morphing into a mockery of sadness. Go ahead. You've already taken my life, Iona said before she spat on him. Anova slipped from where she'd been wedged among the spectating fae, hungry for spilled blood. She could feel Nerium on her heels. Leander hadn't taken his eyes off the fae king. His hand had gone to his waist, under his cloak. In the dim night, absent of moonlight, something glimmered silver and sharp. He's going to do it. Now. Anova didn't care who saw. She pushed Faye out of her way as she ran for him. Her heart held in place. They weren't moving fast enough. The High King snapped his fingers, and Malor stepped forward as he raised his blade high. The Fay King leaned forward in anticipation of the blood splatter. Traitor, the creature said through his teeth. The fey around her were riveted on the sight. There's nothing more they love than an execution. If Anova were Leander, she would have chosen this moment to assassinate the fey king too. All eyes were on the high king, Iona, and the heavy blade above her throat. Anova broke through the last line of spectating fey, stopping just before crashing into the edge of the king's guard. Her brain was a storm on the ocean, a mass of chaos. But one thought stood out like the strike of lightning in the storm clouds. I have to stop him. But what did that mean? To save him, what would she do? Her unspoken answer echoed back in her mind. Whatever it takes. Her hand wrapped around her mask. She would even do this if it meant he didn't destroy himself. Through the bedlam and massive fay around them, their eyes locked. Leander's eyes were wide and full of wild emotion. His expression was more real than she'd ever seen. Something in his face cracked like a piece of glass. She felt as if time, space, and sound had distorted. The only other person in the room was him. She could see a vein emerge from the arm that held so tight onto his half concealed weapon. One pull of a muscle, and it would be over. One movement was all that it would take. Carefully, so slowly that she could hardly bear it, she lowered her hand. He did the same. He stepped back, his eyes flicking between Nerium's face and hers. Anova breathed because she could do little else. Not yet. There was a commotion in front of them. Maller was on the ground, the blade of his weapon stuck clean through his chest. He gargled blood as red as his eyes. Her other executioner was face down on the floor. 
There was no sign of a wound, but there was also no movement. Behind Iona's back, she held a gray light in her bound hands. A weak sliver of moonlight had escaped the high windows, and she was standing in it. Fay magic. This was the last night before the new moon, and moonlight was almost gone from the skies. But she'd drawn it to her. Don't come any closer, Iona shouted at the Fay around her. The Fay King tried to smile, but it looked decidedly forced to Anova. Now that was too far, Iona. A chill ran down Anova's spine. For the first time, she saw behind the mask that the High King wore. He was furious. She couldn't even find joy inside her at seeing the king's enforcer and executioner dead. They were all too close to death for her to revel in it now. Miriam and Leander were staring at each other. Her breath caught. Had Leander figured out their new plan so easily? Was this the moment they were going to assassinate the Fey King together? With barely any movement, Miriam slipped from her side and edged closer to the spectacle before them. She didn't miss the spark had escaped his closed fist. Before they could act, a force blasted through the floor, spewing pieces of tile and chunks of earth. Long spines like claws darted from the new holes in the floor and pushed together at one point. They pierced Iona's heart straight through. Chapter 42 In the chaos that followed the execution, Anova was certain of few things. She knew she should slip into the shadows, out of the visible ring of fey that had gathered to gawk. She knew they'd underestimated the High King. And she knew he had to be killed, no matter what. Miriam was gone from her side. It was the smart thing to have done. They shouldn't be seen together anymore, not after the Fae started spilling blood. Anova took to the edges of the room where she felt safest, though a concept such as safe in this house was laughable now. The Fae with their masks and war paint danced and cheered on the High King's orders. It turned her stomach. Iona was dead. She couldn't see what had happened to the Fae's body. She hoped that one of them had taken the corpse out of the room. But her blood had started seeping deeper into the floor tiles of Leander's dining hall. Anova tried to control her breathing. Her fingers brushed the handle of the knife she wore. Even with all their magic and quick reflexes, none of the other fey were a match for the thing she'd just witnessed. What kind of fey magic was that? He didn't even draw out moonlight. She found she didn't wish to find out. Her teeth gritted in her head against her disgust. How could a human such as herself do anything against these monsters? She hated feeling like a mouse hiding in the domain of cats. She should find Leander or Nerium, but there was something that she needed to do which they would not agree with. Another whisper spoke in the back of her cranium. There are a few things that only mice can do. Anova began swaying her body to the music, newly pouring out into the air from some unseen stringed instrument. She wondered idly if it was from a real instrument or if it was another magicked fey illusion. It didn't matter. She moved through them, and they didn't glance more than once at her. They celebrated the killing of their own kin, drunk on the idea of spilling more blood. In revolutions, tyrants were slaughtered. But just as often, the weak and powerless were slaughtered at the same time, simply because the opportunity existed. While she lived, she wasn't going to stand for that. No matter what her fey accomplices would say, she needed to do this. The closer she got to the cage of humans, the more nauseated she grew. Not only was it filled with her people, but they were exclusively children. Anova's heart throbbed. At any moment, the reveling fey could catch her. There'd be no explaining away this. When she looked up to see the children huddling together, it didn't matter. Most of them sobbed quietly, and she guessed that they'd ran out of loud wails and pleading. 
The girl that she'd noticed earlier was still alone by the edge of the cage. Dark hair surrounded her face. She wasn't crying. She was watching her. Smart. Anova crouched so her body was hidden by the feast table. After pulling free one of her poisoned knives, careful not to touch its edge, she went to work picking the lock. A voice spoke. I'll make you sick if you eat me. Anova froze. It had been the girl. She had to be careful. If she screamed, or if the other children noticed, they could blow her cover before she helped them escape. I'm not going to eat you. Her voice was low and calm, or so she hoped. I need you to do something for me. I need you to keep quiet. I'll get you out. The girl's eyes were trained on Anova's crouched form near her. You're lying. You're opening this to eat us all for yourself. Anova's pulse raced. Her hands worked even faster. Am not quiet, she hissed in warning. The girl rose to her feet as well as she could. I'll not be quiet, you monster. Anova threw herself below the table and watched the revelry for any sign that the Fae had noticed the girl's outburst. No sign of Nerium or Leander. She couldn't worry about them right now. She slipped from underneath the table, still not convinced she wasn't being watched despite the distraction of the execution celebration. Anova suppressed a shudder at the thought. She glared at the girl and moved part of her hair for a second. I'm human. But the girl's expression didn't change. You're one of them, she countered. It was then that Anova understood. Even if she wasn't Fay, she was one of the ones in power. One of the ones outside the cage. This girl was betrayed by her own people. Somewhere down the line, a human had sold a child to the Fae. She cursed under her breath. Anova's gaze darted back to the rest of the room. Freeing a group of human children in the middle of this blood celebration. Anova frowned. There was only one solution. She flipped the blade so that the point was facing her and moved the handle so that it passed through the cage's woven pieces. It's yours. Saw through your cage when they leave you alone. It's been poisoned, so don't use it on yourself or the others. Disbelief flashed across the girl's face. So fast that Anova nearly didn't see it, the girl snatched the weapon. It left her with only one poisoned knife, but it would have to be enough. As she left the caged humans behind to blend in with the Fae once more, a voice whispered behind her ear. I've spoken with him. It was Nerium. She kept moving as she had been, towards a table filled with goblets. As she picked up one of them, she swirled the liquid around and considered it. Her voice was too low to carry much farther than a pace or so away. He refused our plan? Her eyes darted to the High King. He was dancing with one of his courtesans. Her jaw ached from the tension. Alive for now. Across the table from her, Nerium's mouth hardly moved when he spoke. He agreed. He wishes to speak with you in his rooms. Anova felt weak enough to slide to the ground. She turned from the table after replacing the goblet of swirling fey wine. We'll meet there. It was the last she heard of him before he disappeared from her sight. She cursed the fey for their soundlessness and made for the entry hall, glad to be quit of this room. After the horrors she'd witnessed, Anova would have thought her mind would have stayed silent as she climbed the stairs of his manor-turned-war camp. But her thoughts ran through her mind like birds at the top of a cage. Did he still think she had tried to poison him with Wolfsbane? What if their plan didn't work? What if the crown still went to Nerium or Leander? As she approached the door to his rooms at the end of the maze of halls, she remembered the last night they'd spent together the touch of his skin, the soft caress against her forehead. How much of it had been fake? How much of it had been real? Her heart told her to consider it all the cruel fey trick that it was. It was easier on her heart that way. It didn't have to bear the heaviness of hope 
or the bitterness of reality. Things were easier on her that way, too. Despite living in his manor for weeks, she'd never entered his personal rooms. Anova wasn't sure what to expect when she stepped inside. His bedroom was about as big as a tavern's lower floor. Her head spun as she walked inside. Finely crafted fay furniture was abundant. A lounge chair that looked plush enough to sleep on was pushed against a wide window. Books and maps were stacked on tables. As soon as she started inspecting the room, movement jerked her gaze to the side. Built into one wall were panels of mirrors stretching from end to end. Vain, this one is. She was looking into the mirrors when he appeared mere paces behind her. She stifled her curses. He was staring right back at her. Her throat felt clogged. You came back. She swallowed. His words had undone something within her. She needed to speak, even if she revealed some of her fool heart. Because of you. Anova couldn't move. The words were gone and out of her mouth now. Leander's voice was even-toned, as if it had been carefully modulated not to reveal anything. And you cared what happened to me after that. There was no misinterpreting what he meant by that. That day had been imprinted on her memory, and there it would stay until she died. Anova turned on her heels and found him much closer than she'd anticipated. Her breath was stolen, and the words that had been on her tongue left her. She breathed him in. Instead of responding to his question, she said, You could have let me die when I killed him myself. I wouldn't have known that the crown would be fatal to me. It would have solved all your problems. Instead of... His eyes were dark. Are you disappointed I didn't do it myself? She exhaled. The game that they'd been playing was coming to a close. Even so, she felt that each of them had pawns to kill yet. They staged themselves behind them like shields, the words that they parried back and forth. No one else is allowed to kill you, she said in response. Then you should be glad I saved you the honor. His words raised chills on her skin. At once, he grabbed her hand in his and pressed it flat against his skin, just inside the low neckline of his shirt. She felt his strong heartbeat, and her own raged in response. She blinked, struggling for words when she knew he could clearly hear her response. When she could speak again, she said, You don't have to fake this for me anymore. Anova made the mistake of peeking into his eyes. They blazed, glaring back at her with an intensity that robbed her of thought. You think this is fake? Anova felt dizzy under his gaze. Her eyes focused on his too perfect, arrogant lips. Sometime, her hand had moved from his chest to the back of his neck as he pulled her closer. A knock, and she realized where she was. A breath away from kissing him. They pulled apart as Nerium entered the room. His eyes swept the room for what she assumed were spies. When he appeared satisfied, Nerium announced, It's time. The dinner feast is nearly set in the dining hall. Able to think straight again, Anova rested her hand on the handle of her remaining poisoned knife and nodded. They had a job to do here. One last job. Better that she not be distracted at the height of it. She turned to Leander. You've agreed to our proposal, then. In that moment, Leander looked as the commander of the Fey King should. Correct. Nerium will cloak himself in shadows with the help of moonlight, waiting behind the king for when I act. My presence will be expected, so I will remain at his highness's right side until the opportune moment. I'll remain at the table, visible as well, Anova guessed. It was what her and Nerium's original plan had been. Since she couldn't slit the High King's throat herself, she would do the next best thing, slit a few other fey throats. For the cover you'll need, she added. Leander's eyes narrowed. Only if necessary. She raised her eyebrows but didn't argue. 
when the time came, she would be the judge of how many faith throats needed to be slit. We're in agreement then, Leander said to Nerium. Do you have everything for your part? Nerium produced a vial of liquid moonlight. Enough for five nights of cloaking. He replaced it inside his shirt. For security, we shouldn't be seen together again before the assassination. Anova nodded. She'd expected that part. She and Juris had pulled off variations of this con before. Sans the execution of a fey royal, of course. Something in her throat tightened. She would do this for him, and for all humans. She would kill the High King herself before she let him pillage her lands and hurt her people. Leander turned to her again, appearing to search her face for something. He stopped after a moment and met her gaze. You are going to survive, Anova, no matter what. Promise me that. She tisked at his words. He should know her better by now. I would sooner kill all of Fay myself than die here. His eyes glimmered at that, and he smirked. That's my girl. Chapter 43 with her war mask firmly in place, Anova slipped back within the Fey, hungry to invade her people's lands. Her heart was in her throat as she searched for the children locked inside the cage, but she found no sign of them. She hoped it meant they were escaping now. Instead of the cages, the tables had been cleared to support a feast of delicacies. Anova paused to examine the meat and breathed in relief when she saw only recognizable animals like salmon, trout, and roasted pheasant. She took her seat among the fae at the table where, at the far end, the High King lounged. Leander had already returned, and she hoped Nerium was in place. On either side of her were fae, one with war paint smeared across his face and another with claws like knives on the ends of her fingers. Anova didn't take her focus entirely away from that one. Soon after she'd taken her seat, Faye's servants began distributing drinks on silver plates. When hers was delivered to her, Anova brought the glass close to her face and smelled it. Her mouth watered as she watched the dregs of fruit pulp gather at the bottom of the glass. It was apple cider, and the last time she'd had any of the sort had been in the last chance in Urbes. Despite the piles of food before her and the lack of proper food she'd gotten during her return to Urbes, her gaze didn't stray from the goblet of juice. A frown slipped through her facade. The last chance won't be there anymore if we fail tonight. There would be no more awful ale or tangy cider to be had there. Would they burn the building? Or just stain the floors with the blood of the humans inside? Her hand was trembling. She pulled it back into her lap before her neighbors could see. The High King started speaking, and the conversations of the Fae around her dropped to silence. On one night from tonight, we will march for war. All around her, their cheers eclipsed his voice. Anova played her part, leaning forward with feigned eagerness in case one of them watched her. We have already witnessed their attempts at infiltrating Fey. The humans have grown sick with greed and envy. They must be stopped before they take this land for their own uses, said the Fey King. Anova's stomach roiled, but she bit her tongue. He continued after his subjects calmed again. Too long have they taunted us, seeping the strength of the earth and the power of the moon. We will strike when their armies are unaware. We will take the land for Fay once and for all. All around her, their war cries were deafening. We have no armies. We have no magic to steal moonlight. It's all lies. Her knuckles ached with the desire to pull him from his throne and make him swallow his words. Soon. She let the word form a cocoon around her. Soon, the three of them would work together, and if fortune really were on her side, they would destroy this bloody line of fey royalty permanently. 
Anova wanted it more than she remembered wanting anything. Her hand itched to return to the blade sheathed at her waist, coated in enough poison to kill at least one of them. Soon. Anova nearly missed the toast that all the fae at the table were making. The High King had raised his mug at the end of his war speech, apple cider sloshing over the side of it. Her fingers curled around the goblet. Though it sickened her, she rose the drink to the heavens as her voice joined the others. To Fay. She couldn't toast to the High King, not even for her disguise. They were close enough to their goal that she could nearly scent the blood in the air already. Anova waited a few seconds before bringing the cider to her lips. Some of the Fay had already drained their drinks or sloshed it over their chests. If they were going to drop dead, it probably would have started happening by now. Even so, she wanted to throw up. She wanted to spit in anything that came from him. Instead, she allowed a small sip of apple cider past her lips. Like everything that came from Fay, it had unearned quality. She drank another sip. Anova's eyes went to Leander on the far end of the table. She would take her cues from him when he acted, and not a moment before. He had replaced his drink on the table before him, one of his knuckles supporting his chin. He was the perfect picture of the ungrateful heir to a fey family name and estate. On the king's other side, Helmir tossed his bitter apple into the air. He looked across the way at Leander, and his mouth moved too fast for Anova to read his lips. Leander's stare was dead. He didn't respond to whatever Helmir had said. Anova breathed through her nostrils, trying to control the storm inside her. She would wear more than one mask here among this table of monsters. Beside her, she heard the female fae say with a lilting, hissy voice, Those rats will get what they deserve. She held her goblet high, her black eyes on Anova. Her stomach tightened in revulsion, and she itched to unsheathe her weapon. She could feel Leander's eyes on her. Not yet. Almost. Anova mirrored her neighbor in a toast as a devilish smile spread across her face. All of it, she murmured. When Anova's hand went to her dagger at her waist, creatures began to spread at her feet. A swarm of chittering locusts multiplied until they covered the floor. What's going on? Her heart beat too fast in her chest until it eclipsed even the sounds of the insects. She looked up to see that her dinner companion's dark eyes had acquired a red tint that was the color of blood. I need to kill her. The fey lady smiled, and blood leaked like tears from her lids. I need to kill them all for killing mother. Anova's hand groped for the weapon she knew was at her waist, but all she could feel was protruding bone. For killing Juris and Leander. Nausea swelled in her like a tidal wave, and she was sick on the floor. The bugs were gone. The fae's bloody tears were gone. She blinked, and for a moment, saw the truth of it all. She reached for it within the fogs of her brain. She'd been drugged. In fact, she was fairly sure that she'd ingested ground seeds of a flower she knew too well. Morning glories. The Fae were all staring at her, but all that she could concentrate on was Leander's face. She held tight to it among the chaos of images and sounds begging to be acknowledged. But something else was bothering her. None of them were vomiting or reeling from the bugs all around them. Only she'd been drugged, or... His voice echoed around her, coming throughout different directions in the dining hall. It was a memory. Humans are much more fragile than us in more ways than one, Leander said. They were in his greenhouse. It takes significantly more toxin to affect us than it does you. After a moment, he added, It's because of this that humans make the best wine tasters, and the king isn't aware of this. It hasn't affected him yet. It's poison, she shouted to Leander. Or at least, 
She hoped those were the words that had come out of her mouth. Anova tried to ignore the locusts crawling up her leg, pinching her skin where they walked, but she wasn't so convinced they weren't real anymore. Where is my dagger? Something was in her fist, and she aimed her weapon at her thigh where most of them were. I should be doing something. Killing bugs is doing something, the other voice in her head argued. A voice broke through the haze, squatting in her brain. It was Leander's. Her gaze shot up. Leander was standing, and his eyes were bright. In his hands was a blade. It was happening. And yet, the High King didn't seem concerned. He was still seated, lounging back in his chair. He spoke, and his words cut through her delusions and the haze of chittering insects. This isn't quite what you planned, is it, Cadmus? No. 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 Too many things happened at once for her to understand it all. The bugs were back. They'd made it to her mouth by now. They clamored for her throat. Leander, no, Cadmus, was swinging the terrible blade in his hands. But he'd spun on his heels in response to some stimuli she couldn't see. He was fighting an invisible monster, and it seemed to be winning. A shadow twitched in the gloom at the edges of the hall. A blade twinkled against moonlight. Despite the bugs clogging her mouth, she hurtled herself forward. She had a mission to carry out, even if it had turned disastrous. She would be the distraction that they needed, that Nerium needed. Anova held high her weapon, surprised to discover it wasn't her poisoned dagger, but a sword staff from one of his guards. She didn't question how she'd gotten it. The first of her opponents was easy. She'd hooked the end of her blade under the vulnerable edge of the guard's armor. They're not expecting an opponent who can fight, she realized with glee. The room spun around her, but she held her ground. The High King's voice soared through the air. Oh, someone do away with the mortal already. She can't be that difficult to subdue. She hoped it had given Nerium time to act, at least. As your highness commands. It was Helmir's voice. She couldn't see him for the swarm of hornets that had joined the locusts on the floor. Her stomach knotted itself. She feared she would be sick again. It was then that her perception cleared enough for her to see Nerium blink into visibility at the far end of the room. In his raised fist was one of the poisoned daggers aimed for the back of the High King's neck. It was a perfect, deadly strike. Had it landed. The earth groaned as spikes burst out of it like bones breaking skin. The room started spinning around her before she saw what happened to Nerium. Anova hit the cold floor with a thud. There was a soft chuckle at her neck. Not difficult at all. Chapter 44 Anova woke in a pool of blood. Only a few seconds of terror passed before she realized it all came from the freshly killed rabbit next to her. She didn't focus on it. There was no saving it now. She was in a small dark room by herself, other than the rabbit, and a few other mundane objects such as dusty goblets and dinnerware sets in boxes on the floor. The space was only big enough for her to walk three or so paces in any direction. It was only when she saw the three portraits, stacked so they faced the wall, that she understood where she was. She was in a closet within Wolfsbane Manor. After finding the door locked, she sat down again and breathed as she picked through what she remembered. The High King had discovered their identities and planned to assassinate him, and he'd drugged them. A lump formed in her throat. Why hadn't he used a lethal poison in the first place? Because he wanted to make a spectacle of us first. It accomplished the same as with Iona's execution. They were both public displays of the consequences of opposing him. Anova was still. It could have ended there. In fact, she should have been dead by now. But why wasn't she? She inspected her clothes and found them to be as they had been. Before Nerium's fey magic, that was. There were no new wounds on her body either. Another thought occurred to her then. It must be daytime. They marched ahead. 
I was left behind. Her blood pounded in her veins. So they thought she wasn't even worth the effort of killing, did they? But a voice in her sang against it. The High King wouldn't leave a conspirator to his assassination alive, at least not for long, and certainly not to unattended. Not even a lowly human. He'd killed his right hand, Leander's father, just on suspicion. Something cold settled in her stomach. Are Leander and Nerium dead? There was a strong possibility of it. Her hands trembled. She needed to get out of this room. If nothing else, she needed to stop the Fey King. Anova rose to her feet and once more tried the door. When it didn't budge, she shoved an ear against the edge of it. Silence greeted her. She shoved herself into the door over and over, but in her heart, she knew better. Aside from a Fey's strength to force it open, the only thing that would unlock a door was its key or a lockpick. Anova cursed her luck and slammed against the floor in frustration. Her teeth gritted together. Now was not the time for a child's tantrum. She was a burglar. Breaking in and out of rooms was what she did best, aside from lying and cheating. As she looked around her, she realized what was on the floor with her, aside from the growing pool of blood from the rabbit. There was forest detritus from her mask that Nerium had made her. Her heart jumped into her throat. Among the leaves were pine needles and twigs. It wasn't perfect, but perhaps it would work. With a pine needle between her finger and thumb, she started to pick the fey lock. It wasn't much different from human-made locks, which was a mistake for the fey. Anova drew a sharp gasp. The pine needle wasn't stiff enough. She picked up the thinnest twig she could find and started her work again. What if he's dead? What happens then? Anova's breaths became shallower and shallower. What if she was too late to even save her people? What if more than a few hours had passed? What if there were no humans left to save? The twig crumbled in her grasp. Anova waited for the shivers to pass and for her mind to quiet. It wasn't working fast enough. She clenched her trembling hands into fists. If there was no one else to save, then she would become the knife that would spill the last drops of blood on a field of bodies. She would end him and all futures where Fay like him were rulers. She would end it all. Anova's fists relaxed against her thighs. It was then that she noticed. In her panic, she hadn't realized it was resting in its sheath. She was still armed with one of her poisoned knives. Her head swam with questions, but she smothered them within herself and pulled the blade free of its prison. As she inserted the tip of the knife into the lock, she held her breath. Within minutes, she heard the click of the tumblers within the lock. She pushed it open by a finger width. After holding still for another moment to make certain her enemies hadn't been waiting for her, she pushed the door open enough for her to slip through it. She was free. With the knife low at her waist, she inspected her surroundings. She was inside Leander's study, which looked to have been wrecked by the High King's army. They'd pushed bookcases and furniture against the walls with little regard to them. As she'd feared, sunlight streamed in through the high windows. Anova kept silent as she scouted the room. It was empty. Like a phantom, she moved through the rest of the manor. Although they'd left behind their filled goblets and their messes, the fae were gone. Her heart beat itself against her ribs. Before her was the empty dining hall. Their chairs had been left in place, and scraps of food had been left on their plates. What had happened after they'd been drugged? Why had she been spared? After finding it disappointingly bereft of weapons, Anova left behind the manor. Outside, the world was too bright. Her stomach tightened and her hands shook, but she forced herself to walk among the speared heads. Their gazes were glassy and dead. She swallowed the bile that had arisen in her throat. Although she'd seen familiar fay among the dead, she hadn't found Leander or Nerium. A scent of iron carried on the breeze. Anova snapped her head in the direction of the forest's edge. 
Birds skittered when she walked under them. Anova stopped when she saw it. Blood was splattered on every surface imaginable. It had dribbled from leaf to leaf. It had soaked into the ground like rain. The smell was thick enough to summon her nausea. In the pool of blood was a sword staff like the Fey King's guards carried. Anova remembered. It came to her like lantern light through fog, but it came to her. She was being carried in the arms of a fay. Anova fought, but she wasn't sure what or who was real, including Helmir. She thought she heard Leander's voice, but it faded to the sound of the hornets buzzing around her head. It was too heavy to hold up anymore. Put me down, you monster, she hissed. They were moving too fast for even her hornets to follow. Helmir chuckled, though there was an edge to it. His words were almost too quiet for her to hear. While his voice was light, his lips formed a strict line. You should be thanking me, darling. Any of those fae would be glad to rip you apart. They're only letting me take you because my reputation as a monster precedes me. I don't care. Put me down, she said. Instead of doing that, Helmir continued talking. Even your beloved Wolfsbane would cut you down should you stand in the way of his goal. Anova tried to speak to contradict him, but her tongue was too heavy for it. The problem with him is that he rejects supreme power, Helmir said under his breath. Even when there are so many useful ends for it. Anova closed her eyes. It was easier to do so than try to make sense of Helmir's words and the fey goblins snapping at her feet. She could only focus on so much. The moon touched her skin, and she opened her eyes. They were outside. She was also tied to a tree. The forest stirred around them with a breeze. She ground her teeth together, but Helmir didn't turn around. Let me go, she said between her teeth or I'll do something to you much worse than what you plan to do to me. Worse, you say? Helmir turned around. His eyes glimmered at the prospect. In his hands was a rabbit, its eyes wide. White light flashed where he held it, and the poor creature's eyes dimmed. A second later, he took a knife to its throat and blood spurted across the area. Anova swallowed her disgust. She wasn't planning to stay and discover for what reason he'd done such a gruesome act. With a sharp inhale, she slipped from under the rope that tied her to the tree and sprinted. If it hadn't been for the swarm of locusts, she would have made it, or so she was certain. His arms were tight around her and her belly flopped. You don't want to do that, he said, his eyes black and dangerous. I won't participate in your sacrificial ritual. She spat. I'm faking your death, darling, he said in her ear. Her legs grew weak, even though she knew his words were trickery. Rabbit blood smells remarkably similar to human. Of course, it helps that I'll smell like you now, too. His chuckle made her want to strangle him. She jerked out of his grasp, and he let her. Perhaps he could see that she could barely stand, or the fog in her brain was becoming hard to resist. And why would you do that? He closed the short distance between them. Because when I'm High King, I want you to be my queen. His eyes were violet black in the darkness. And that is the difference between me and your lover boy, aside from the fact that I yet live. After that, the last thing she remembered was vomiting the little of what remained in her stomach. As she went to the manor's stables in search of a horse, she plotted. A new plan started to blossom in her mind, layered and beautiful. This would be her last and greatest plan yet. There was no one else who would do this for her. It had always needed to be her. Anova was going to kill the High King herself, no matter who it was. She was going to destroy the blood crown for good. 
Chapter 45 She hoped her horse would forgive her for riding him so hard. Her own body, she ignored. Soon, I'll rest. Soon, there'll be no more of this. Perhaps Anova should have felt more panic or fear for her approaching death. But her death, she considered, was just another bargain. Her life for the end of a reign. Her life for uncountable humans' lives. Nerium and Leander had already paid the price to try to stop him. Her stomach nodded. She could at least try. For them. Could he yet live? Or is there no mercy in this world at all? After all, the High King couldn't suffer such a thing. Thinking on them too long slowed her, so she kept the thought of the two fae tight in her chest where she kept the memories of her mother. The forests blazed past her, and she felt the eagerness of the colt underneath her. He was wilder than she would have liked, likely the reason he'd been left behind by the marching fae armies. But he was fast. Above, the sun kept time for her. Hours passed, though she found the discomfort of the ride easy to ignore. When they broke into the boundary forests, the sun was well beyond its zenith. In an hour or so, Vesper gloom would settle throughout Fay. She couldn't wait that long. If the Fay armies had slept at all, they would be waking soon. They were easy to track. His soldiers had hewn the vegetation for their armies to pass through. If there was any luck in the world yet left to her, they hadn't passed through the barrier yet. Anova heard them before she saw them. She let the colt free. She had no use of him anymore, and he deserved the freedom and rest. She couldn't rest yet, but she promised herself that she would soon. After she found a tree of suitable height, she started to pull herself through it. The war camp stretched before her like a sore in the middle of the boundary forests. Even from this far of a distance, she could see that they'd made tents. She was in luck. She waited and watched for what she needed to see. Her plan required she assume a specific identity within his war camp. Anything less, and it would all fail. When a figure emerged from one of the tents at the edges of the camp, her pulse raced. There could be no doubt. It was his courtesan's tent. Anova slid from the tree as noiselessly as she could. The Fae were waking, and soon they'd cross the barrier where she couldn't follow. She stuck to the darkness of the forest as she raced by the edge of the camp. The sun had started to cast its long, finger-like shadows, and she used them to her advantage. Anova watched from her cover rubbing the hilt of her remaining weapon. Although she ached to, she couldn't afford to use the poisoned knife for this end. Threats would have to do the trick this time. Slipping from the shadows, she passed into the camp noiselessly. Anova shoved herself against the tent, listening. As she'd hoped, she didn't hear conversation within. When she shifted through the heavy canvas, she saw she'd struck gold. Within this partitioned room of their tents was a bedroom. Sleeping in a wide frame bed was one of his courtesans. Her face was golden and beautiful. Curls moved past her cheeks as she breathed in and out. Anova pulled free her knife from its sheath. She hovered over the sleeping Fay, watching her chest fill with air. If it came to it, she would kill her. Anova knew she should have started there, but she needed to preserve the poison on the edge of the blade. She would give her a chance to agree with Anova's terms. Something stopped her. It was subtle, but enough for her to hear, even with human ears. She heard the shifting of weight. Anova pivoted on her feet, her knife before her faster than she could blink. Familiar golden eyes stared back at her. There's no need for that, Lotharia said. Anova stepped away from the sleeping Fay and towards the one that was awake. We'll see. But Lotharia hadn't seemed to be pleading for the Fay's life. Her face was calculating and careful. I know why you're here, the courtesan said. 
Anova's eyes narrowed. I won't be stopped, even for a fae I like. Lotharia's impassive mouth twitched upwards for seconds. I'm not trying to stop you. Anova stopped, her body frozen in a position that was both defensive and on the verge of attack. Lotharia's eyes went to the sleeping fae. We should speak in my private quarters. I think not. If you're going to speak, then do so, Anova said. When she spoke again, it was almost too fast to process. You're trying to infiltrate our forces to finish what you started. Do you truly think you're the only one who wants what you want? Anova stepped back. It was too good to be true, and such things couldn't be trusted. Why do you want that? Her eyes flicked to the sleeping Fay. You have to know I'm not just going to kill him. I'm going to destroy the crown. Her gaze flicked back to Lotharia's face. You want it for yourself. Her smile wasn't to be trusted. It showed her two sharp teeth. Not quite. The smile disappeared. Though you will die, and the crown with you, your actions will create the circumstances necessary for my son to become king. Without the blood crown, the Fey people will choose their ruler by blood succession. He is the Fey king's only living heir. Living heir. So, the High King didn't kill this one. He must not know. The weight of the knowledge settled on her. Slowly, Anova lowered her poisoned blade until it rested in its sheath. She breathed out. Was this going to create a worse or better future? Did she have a choice to ignore the possibility that it could be better this way? At last, Anova said, Lead me to your room. As Anova had expected, her rooms were filled with elegant things, such as a canopied bed and other furnishings she didn't care to imagine how they'd been trekked all this way. Once Anova had explained her plan, Lotharia agreed to what she'd asked. As she stepped out of her pants that she'd been in for days now, her back to the Fey Lady, Anova said what had been on her mind. Helmir is your son, isn't he? There were a few heartbeats of silence before Lotharia answered. I knew I had to hide him from his father if he were to survive, even if that meant he didn't know me. That's why she was asking about his family. Anova shed the last of her clothes as she considered something. A fey king without a crown. Would Helmir be better than his father? Better without unmatched power? She wouldn't live to know if it was the right choice. Any fey king other than the current one will be the right choice. Anova suppressed a shiver when she remembered Helmir's words to her. He must know of his lineage then, she said suddenly to Lotharia. Lotharia's voice sounded careful. I have started assisting his ascent to the throne. Though it was dangerous to admit, he knows now. Anova frowned, though she'd already donned Lotharia's clothes. It was much too late to go back on her plan. If nothing else, she would stop this war. She would make damn sure to end it before it started. Anova held the black veil that all the king's courtesans were going to wear for his war. When she looked up again, Lotharia had produced a glass jar of black liquid from one of her chests. For your hair, she said. The mask will hide your face, but he would notice the difference in color once you get close to him. Anova narrowed her eyes at the liquid. It's not magic, is it? Black walnut extract, Lotharia said with a twitch of her lips. She couldn't tell if she thought Anova's disdain for fey magic was humorous or prudent. When Anova sat in the chair with Lotharia's hands in her locks, she closed her eyes and allowed herself to think on him again. Her heart fluttered with frail hope, too aware of its own fragility. Are Leander and Miriam dead? Anova couldn't bear to look at Lotharia's face in case it told her the worst. I do not know, 
the fey lady said eventually. Anova nodded to herself. It mattered not, anyway. She could no longer ask another person to be sacrificed for this. After she towel-dried her darkened hair, she could see the black shadows of night seeping into Lotharia's room. It was time. Wearing Anova's clothes, Lotharia started towards the edge of her room, her hand on the tense canvas. She turned her head back towards her. This will be the last you see of me, Anova. I wish you luck. May whatever awaits you on the other side of this life be kinder than this. Chapter 46 Armed with Lotharia's knowledge of what was coming next, Anova left her tent as another of the High King's courtesans. Within the folds of her dress was the poisoned knife. She joined the other courtesans and was reassured when she saw their veils. They can't see through to my face with this on. The fabric was layered with several pieces so that it was difficult to even see her eyes. Black feathers formed the crown of the mask, and silver rings and bells were sewn into the fabric. The veil thinned to mere tulle where it covered her bare shoulders. They were the harbingers of death, and they all knew it. Most of his army had arrived by then. Proper night had fallen, and its shadows draped the boundary forests in utter, moonless darkness. In clothes embroidered with silver veins, he turned to address them. We will sneak into their city as wraiths. We will claim it for Fay even on the most moonless night. He paced before them all, a slow smile creeping to his face. For we will only grow stronger after this. All their forces will crumble in a single night. Anova's stomach turned, but she celebrated with the war-drunk Fay. We march for their lands now, he said when they'd quieted. And by dawn, everything in sight will be ours. As they prepared to move as one towards the boundary line, Anova started for the white horse that she knew was the High King's. A cluster of his guards blocked her view, but there could be no mistaking whose mount it was. The first one blocked her with an open palm. Cornelia will be riding with the king into the human lands. You'll have to wait your turn. Anova resisted the urge to pull out her weapon. Instead, she merely nodded and returned to her place in the march. It would have been a massive stroke of luck had she been able to get so close to him on her initial attempt. But first and foremost, she needed not to draw attention to herself. His war party marched the distance to the boundary line and she thought again of Leander and nearly vomited. Nowhere had she seen him. Too much has been sacrificed for this. She put the thought out of her mind for now. The magic was thick upon the air. One of his commanders held his fist high. The High King trotted forth on his horse. She could see the courtesan riding with him, and long golden hair fell down her back where she sat on the horse before him. The back of her head ached. That could have been her. How easily she could have slipped the knife behind her and ended it here. Soon. This time would be different. She could feel it in the marrow of her bones. She would be the one to kill him. The Fey King held his palm flat towards the human lands, and a light pulsed across the air. The barrier was broken. As they crossed into the human's territory, something prickled at Anova's neck. She turned her head in time to see arrows fly from the trees around them. Anova ducked behind the fey around her, aware that she shouldn't be seen carrying any sort of weapon, even in a war. Her heart thrashed inside her. It can't be. Although they weren't practiced with weapons, the fey king's army was faster, stronger, and crueler. The fae ripped the humans from their perches in the trees, even when their limbs became riddled with arrows. Anova snuck closer to the king's cluster of guards between volleys. Too quickly to dodge, an arrow grazed her forearm. She tore some of her veil to stem the bleeding, 
and the pain throbbed underneath her tourniquet. Even so, she could feel her blood seeping from her arm. She had to finish this. It was then that she saw some of the humans up close. Many were constables and city guards, but not all. Her heart plummeted. Some of them were from the rosebud. She couldn't let them die. Another realization hit her like a brick through a window. She'd told Madame Hinterfell about the attack. She must have taken her word for it if the humans were here. Even so, rage flared up inside her. Why make them fight this battle? Was it because her mother's friends were the expendable ones? Anova was almost to the circle of his guards when a human leaped from the branches of a tree. He'd been cloaked in the shadow, and she hadn't even seen him. Her hand was forced. She pulled free her weapon with her good arm, as he did the same with the small, serrated edge blade that looked as if it would hurt if it touched her. She glared over at him. She'd been so close to. One of his whores. Excellent, he said. Maybe he'll cry over you. Anova's mouth popped open. She dodged his first strike and said in a whisper, Juris, you fool. Don't go calling the kettle black. He froze, his eyes darting from one detail to the next. His voice was almost inaudible. What are you doing? He looked at her arm. You're hurt. Bad. Anova shook her head. There was too much to explain, and she didn't have the time. Her window of opportunity was closing. But perhaps there was another, faster way. It had to work. They continued their dance, only this time, they both struck with wide, predictable movements. It kept eyes off them. She locked gazes with him. You have to hold me hostage. Demand the fighting stop or else you'll kill me. I'll kill the king when you release me to him. His jaw moved like he wanted to do anything but that. Like he knew what the cost would be for her. Trust me, she said in a tight voice. Juris nodded. There was too much history between them for anything else. Despite the pain coming over her in waves, despite the ache inside her chest that had nothing to do with her physical wounds, her muscles relaxed. Soon, it would be done. But she needed to do one last thing. With barely a tilt, she moved her blade across her lips. The poison smeared into her skin, kept wet by the infusion of magic. At once, she felt the effects. Wolfsbane. Hostages of war didn't keep weapons. Besides, faking was what she did best. If Juris had any doubts about what he was about to participate in, he didn't show them. In a blink, he disarmed her of her knife and brought both hers and his under her throat. Anova let out a piercing scream, the end of which was covered up by Juris's words. Drop your weapons or I'll bathe in the blood of your favorite whore, he snarled behind her. The eyes of all fey kind turned to them, monstrous and gleaming for the promise of more blood despite the threat. Over them all, the High King's gaze flicked from her masked face to Juris's. Fury contorted his beautiful features. Release her. You worm! Her heart sped like a jackrabbit's. A twisted kind of pity filled her. He truly loves Lotharia. Juris laughed harshly. You don't seem to understand. Drop your weapons. The High King didn't say anything. Perhaps he didn't know how to acquiesce to a threat. Blood soaked the ground from her wound. Then, a strange thing started to happen. The first clatter of steel against the ground nearly made her jump in the silence. After a moment, more fey dropped their weapons. And then Juris started dragging her backwards, towards the human lands. Anova stomped at the ground, hoping he would understand. This was not the plan. She needed to get to him. What are you doing? She said through her teeth. It's time for a new plan, he whispered back. I don't like this. He's going to kill you once he sees you up close. 
Anova didn't bother to add that she didn't plan to get out of this alive. The High King's voice thundered across the distance to them. Stop where you are! It came from the direction of Fay. Four Fay carried the load, two in front and two in back. It was the human children they'd captured. But there were others inside the cage of rope and woven wood now, too. Though the two of them were badly beaten and bound with rope, her heart soared. No one would bother to hold corpses hostage. Nerium and Leander were inside with them, and they were alive. Her relief was short-lived. After the four fay had placed the cage on the ground, two of them produced torches and lit them with greedy fire. It licked the air, hungry to spread. The children's small fists thrashed at the inside of it. The two fay didn't move. Perhaps they couldn't. Over their cries, the High King said to Juris, Your forces will surrender and you will bring my mate to me. Else, you will cause their slow deaths. Her lips had started to become numb. Sweat broke out across her back despite the strapless dress she wore. The wolf's bane was beginning to poison her. Anova jerked forward like Juris had made her do so. He walked in time with her the knives held tight at her throat. There was another reason now to do this. She was going to save the lives of the humans here today, and the lives of all the humans in Urbess, and the fae she loved. Anova nearly choked on her own spit. Loved? Did she love him? A fae? They were before the High King now. Release her, the High King commanded his eyes like black fire. And grovel for your life. Anova swayed on her feet when Juris released her. She dared not move her tongue over her lips to test that they were still on her face. The numbness was starting to spread. Behind her, Juris crouched to the ground. She couldn't look back at him for fear that she'd stop. Step by step, she walked to the tyrant king of Fae. She watched as he took in a sharp breath at her disheveled appearance. My rose, Letharia, he whispered. Anova's blood moved even faster through her. It was as if it knew that her body had moments of life left. But within her mind, the storm had calmed at last. For the first time in her life, it was all so simple. She might have been a rotten liar and a cheat, but maybe she could do something right for once in her life. Maybe she could save him. Anova kneeled at the High King's feet. She'd seen even his closest advisors do the same thing before, so this had been her secondary plan from the start. Though she couldn't feel them anymore, she brushed her lips against the back of his hand to spread the poison there. What if it's not enough? My Letharia, he murmured and moved his hand so that he brushed her jaw under her veil. You're safe. He looked across the area away from her. Light the cages. When he looked down at her again, he said in that muted voice, Their screams are for you. Anova didn't think. Her body knew the answer before she did. The world spun around her as she rose, but she didn't stop. She refused to look behind her, and the sounds around her dulled in volume too. The High King allowed her to come close to him, and she whispered hoarsely, My king. She pulled the lower part of her veil away and kissed him. She was thankful for the numbness as she pushed her lips deeper against his. Anova leaned into him. The strength had fled her legs by now, but he didn't pull away from her until her hands had found his neck. Chapter 47 She enjoyed the sound of air escaping his throat. The toxins were deep within her system, Anova knew. 
They skewed her perception and slowed time. It was kind, then, that she could experience choking the High King for longer than it perhaps actually happened. Too soon, the Fey King wrenched her fingers from his neck and ripped the veil from her face to reveal the human underneath. You witch, he hissed. He tried to apprehend her, but she had already fallen to the ground in a heap. Clumsily, she wiped her lips with the fabric of her dress. But it was too late. She was shaking and bleeding. The High King grabbed at his lips. Perhaps the numbness had started for him, too. What have you done to me? Despite the horrors occurring around her, she started laughing. His boot came down on her stomach hard. Answer me, he said. A sheen of sweat had started to coat his forehead. Wolfsbane, she choked out. She smiled up at him. It was true. It had been worth it. See you in the hellfires. She closed her eyes and drifted. To her disappointment, the numbness couldn't keep the cold from her limbs. Anova was no longer sure if she was shaking or still, if she was on solid ground or not, or if she needed to breathe anymore. As it spread to her heart, she thought of just one person. Her heart stilled in her cold chest. Chapter 48 Leander Leander woke to screaming. Second came the heat. They've lit us on fire. He was inside a cage beside Nerium and several shrieking human children. He didn't begrudge them the shrieking. His body refused to move, and it wasn't only for the wounds and bruises scattered across his body. Although the pain behind his left eye still throbbed. The bastard had tied him up, too. He would have smiled had he had the time. Given the chance, Leander would have done the same thing to him. Nerium, he called to the other fay, but he didn't respond where he was tied up and slumped against the bottom of the wooden cage. The smoke had started to fill his lungs already. They didn't have time for this. The human children were generally panicking except for one of the girls. She was crouched low beside a spot in the woven wood pieces. And she had a knife. Come here, he yelled to her. That's Faye made. You're not strong enough. The girl glanced behind her at him, just for a second before returning to sawing the wood. She'd already made a sizable dent in it, but the trouble was, she wasn't going to get through it before most of them burned alive. Cut my bindings and I'll do that much faster, he offered. This time, she didn't even turn around. The flames had met in the zenith of the cage above them. The heat was nearly unbearable, and sweat soaked through his clothes. It was almost enough lubrication to allow him to slip out of his robes, but almost wasn't going to cut it this time. I'm not one of them, he said finally. Are you ready to stake your life on your distrust? At his words, the girl stopped. Slowly, she looked back at him. Her hands looked burnt already. It was as if she recognized someone then. In a blink, the girl darted to her feet and ran to him. She started at his hands. Smart one. He helped her with the others until he could stand on his own again. His body hadn't healed as much as it had needed to, but it mattered not anymore. The memories of what had happened before he'd been beaten by his guards threatened to overwhelm him then. He killed her. He killed her. He killed her. The little girl was looking at him. Leander stopped shaking. He had something to do here, and it wasn't to break down. But he killed her. His teeth dug into his tongue hard enough to taste blood. It was all the expression he allowed himself. There would be hell to pay, but he needed to get out of here first. He pressed the full force of his body into the sawing action, pulling it back and forth faster than any human could hope to do. Smoke clouded the top of the cage and he tasted ash. Leander kicked the remainder of the wood out of the way before ducking back inside for Nerium. As he moved, 
He pushed the small humans toward the hole despite their screams. It was a fair enough response for being handled by one of his kind. He killed her. But he had someone left in this world to save. Leander hauled Nerium across his back, his labored breathing too slow for his liking. He held his breath to keep his head clear. After he was sure the last of the human children were out of the cage, he kicked his way through the failing structure to create a big enough escape for them. Outside the flaming cage, it wasn't much better. He couldn't afford to slow down and process what was happening. Fae and humans alike were all around, fighting. To his relief, the human children had seemed to have fled to the rest of the boundary forests. Leander hauled Nerium to the edge of the clearing and sawed away his bindings. Under a moonless night sky, he had no magic to heal him or even medicine. Nerium would have to survive for a few moments without him. When he looked up to the chaos around him, it wasn't hard to find his target among the fights. His body begged for reprieve, but Leander didn't stop. He wasn't going to stop until he found him. Helmir had killed Anova. Now that he'd admitted it to himself, he could allow the pitiful and furious parts of him to merge in his chest. He'd killed her. He'd killed what he'd started to live for again. And then there was the High King. Leander savored the scent of blood on the air. Soon, he would bathe in the Fey King's lifeblood like he'd done with the blood of his parents and brother. But something was happening. Leander ran with the knife he'd taken from the girl low at his waist. The other Fey allowed him to pass, not even noticing that they were enemies and only seeing his inhuman speed and the point to his ears. The High King was stumbling and clutching at his chest. Someone had already tried to kill him. On the ground near him was one of his courtesans. No. Leander felt his chest tighten to the point of pain. Anova was on the ground, unmoving and in an unnatural position. All thoughts left him. He was beside her in a moment. She was much too cold and pale, and blood leaked from a nasty wound at her arm. Leander tightened the fabric around the wound and added the ripped edge of his sleeve on top of it. A dissenting voice within him told him that he was too late. Humans don't come back from things like this. There were too many things wrong, and he had too few things to heal her with. Leander picked her up in his arms. He would be difficult, but perhaps he could bring Nerium too. No, I'll have to hide Nerium until I can come back. And then, just save Nerium. She's gone. Leander wasn't aware that he'd started to shake. It was only when her head flopped to the other side from the force of it that he noticed. He pushed the hair out of her face, even though her breaths were far too few anyway. She was as cold as the ground had been. No. No. A noise stole his attention. Leander looked up. The High King stumbled to the ground. The edge of a sword had pierced clean through his stomach, and the force of his fall barely dislodged it. Its owner pulled it free from the back of the dead king's abdomen and smiled to the chaos around him. It was Helmir. Leander's voice rang loud over the bedlam. That's enough fighting! Lay down your arms! If there was to be a fight, let it be between the two of them only. I believe only the High King could command such a thing, Helmir said. And who's to say I don't enjoy it? His eyes moved to the heap in Leander's arms and tightened inexplicably. Anova was still in his arms. He'd lost track of her breathing, but she didn't appear to be breathing anymore. After a moment of deliberation, he rested her on the ground again. There was only one use for his life now. With one hand, he pulled out the girl's knife and faced hell. The fae around them held their breath as one for what would happen next. The transference of the blood crown. He'd never seen it in person, but his father had ensured that he'd understood what would happen. The High King was as still as a Nova. He'd passed without his notice. As he'd expected, a light flashed where the crown sat atop his head. After a blink, 
It had dissolved like morning mist. Leander felt its coming on the air. Magic this strong tended to leave a mark where it went. Unfamiliar instincts tangled in his chest, and his heart raged. He wanted to run and hide. He wanted to claw at the ground until he found the bones of his ancestors. He needed to see the moon or he would die. As quickly as the feelings had appeared within him, they disappeared. The blood crown was gone from the former High King. But when Leander looked to Helmir, it hadn't appeared on his head. The fae around them gasped and swore. Leander looked down to the human he'd placed on the ground. His stomach twisted. A light was beginning to appear at the top of her head. A nova sucked in a sharp breath, and her entire body shuddered. The blood crown had chosen her. Chapter 49 Anova woke up. She wasn't surprised until she stood and found herself with the same wounds that she thought she'd died with. A bandage had been tightened around her arm where she'd suffered the arrow wound, and it ached. The bright, unfamiliar room swirled around her. Her head was too heavy for clear thinking, but her pulse raced with the knowledge that something was deeply wrong. Perhaps many somethings. Anova catalogued her escape routes before moving. She had one advantage over what could be her captors, and that was that they likely didn't know she'd woken. She left the cushioned bed behind for a wide mirror set into the wall. After a cursory glance over her face, she froze. Her hand went to her head. She couldn't move it. She didn't understand. Sitting on top of her head was the blood crown. Why didn't I die? Sweat coated her nightgown to her skin. She felt as if she couldn't breathe. A nova spun on her feet. Footsteps echoed in the hall outside her room. Anova went to the high window she'd noted earlier and hauled herself up to the ledge. After judging that she wouldn't die if she fell from such a height, she proceeded. The locking mechanism came loose with practiced ease, and she slipped through it to the other side. She was gone in seconds. This concludes A Thorn Among Fae by Joy Lewis. Narrated by Grace Noble. Music by Roman Smith. Copyright 2023 by Joy Lewis.